This episode of the Anchor Point Podcast is going to be brought to you by our friends over at Mystery Ranch, built for the mission. Yeah. Mystery Ranch, let me tell you, they have been giving back to the community, the wildland fire community for a hell of a long time, and they're going to keep continuing to do so. Why do I appreciate them so much? Well, it's because they give a shit. I mean, they give a shit so much that they're even throwing out thousand dollar scholarships for you to advance your wildland fire career with some professional development. If you haven't checked out the Backbone Series scholarship, well, I highly suggest that you do it. Because if you don't, well, you're just leaving money on the table. Yeah, the Mystery Ranch Backbone Series Scholarship is open to anybody who's telling the wildland firefighting story from their perspective. And if it's going to be uh, one of those things that's thoughtful, well put together, and not written in crayon, well, you'll have one of those opportunities to win one of these $1,000 grants. So go over to www.mysteryranch.com and check it out because they give back to the community in a huge way and they want you to succeed. In fact, they're relying on you as well. In fact, check this out. So the hotshot uh, pack, the uh, pack that we all come to love and know so well for, you know, six to eight months out of the year. Well, that was actually built by the boots on the ground. Yeah. Little uh, story. Uh, Dana Gleason, the uh, founder, the OG, if you will, of Mystery Ranch, he went down to uh, SoCal, tied in with a couple of South Ops shot crews, and he said, hey, how can we make going to work a little bit better for you? Well, those two hotshot crews, they poured in their heart and soul and helped develop what you have on your back now. So they are all about giving back to the community and working with the community. So if you want to find out more, go over to www.mysteryranch.com and check it out and make sure to check out that Backbone series. It is awesome. Once again, www.mysteryranch.com. Go check it out. This episode of the Anchor Point Podcast is going to be caffeinated by none other than Hot Shot Brewery. It's kick-ass coffee for a kick-ass cause, and a portion of the proceeds will always go back to the Wildland Firefighter Foundation. So if you're looking for all of the tools of the trade to get your morning started off right, or a whole slew of Wildland Firefighter-themed apparel, or just some kick-ass coffee for a kick-ass cause, look no further than Hot Shot Brewery. You can go find them over at www.hotshotbrewing.com and check this out. There's a little secret hidden page on there. It's not really hidden. It's really in the nav menu, but you can get some uh, Anchor Point merch as well while you're over there. Yeah, they've been supporting the uh, podcast for a hell of a long time. So ever, pretty much ever since the beginning of it. Yeah. But anyways, if you want to find out more, go over to www.hotshotbrewing.com where you can find all of the tools of the trade to get your morning started off right. All of that wildland firefighter themed apparel and some kick-ass coffee for a kick-ass cause. Go check them out. The Anchor Point Podcast is, well, they're not sponsored by, they're not brought to you by, but it is one of those close relationships I have with Bethany over there at the American Wildfire Experience. And uh, yeah, I just want to show her some love for as long as I possibly can because I believe in her cause and I believe in her mission and she's got some rad stuff going on. And if you don't know what the American Wildfire Experience is, well, they house the Smoky Generation. And I know for a fact, a lot of people out there have seen that rolling around. It's pretty freaking awesome. What it is, is basically a digital storytelling pl platform, uh, telling the story of wildland fire. There's quite literally, there's, there has to be like over 250 of these stories out there now, but it's preserving the legacy of the uh, folks in the field and the story of wildland fire. And some of these stories even date back to the 1940s. It's pretty freaking bitching. So if you want a little history lesson, or if you want to sign up for the Smoky Generation grant program, if you got a compelling story and you're telling the story of wildland fire through the lens of a camera, a video camera or a still camera through a blog, through some animation, there was this one dude out there who made uh, We Move Mountains with Spoons and it's freaking kick ass and they're a Smoky Generation grant recipient. Yeah, sky's the limit. Tell the story. It's freaking awesome. Anyways, if you want to find out more, go over to www.wildfireexperience.org and you can check it all out. Once again, www.wildfireexperience.org. Bethany, you have a kick ass organization over there. Keep it up. The views and opinions of this podcast do not reflect the views and opinions of the United States government, the Department of the Interior, the Department of Defense, the Department of Agriculture, the United States Forest Service, the Bureau of Land Management, National Park Service, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, or any private, municipal, county, or state firefighting organization, any law enforcement agency, any medical provider, or any contractor employed by any federal agency.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Anchor Point Podcast. I hope everybody's doing well, especially those folks up in Canada. I uh, hope slogging through the bogs is uh, treating you okay. And I know that you've got your hands full from BC all the way over to Nova Scotia, practically. We have a lot of lightning starts uh, up there and uh, the fuel moistures and the weather and those heat domes, they're just lining up to provide the perfect uh, breeding ground, if you will, for fires to start and go, well, quite a distance quite a few HA, quite a few hectares or acreage, uh, depending on what scale they're, you're using. So I uh, hope everybody up there is staying safe and uh, getting after it. But uh, I just want to say something. I want to, I want to, I, I, I don't comment. Uh, I don't do the commentary thing. I don't do the politics. I don't, that's not my jam. I, it's not for me. Fires happen. All right. We got that. However, Yes, did all these wildfires, especially in the eastern provinces, start all seemingly at once? Oh, big, big surprise, everybody. Well, guess what? They're not fucking directed energy weapons. And the only uh, directed energy weapon that is starting these fires is provided by nature itself, and it's called lightning. Yeah. So this is what happens when you have fuels, topography, winds, weather, all that stuff in alignment with lightning. This is what happens. And now we can see these photos circulating all the news outlets on the East coast and saying, Oh wow, we can't see five feet in front of each in front of ourselves because of all this wildfire smoke. Well, I'm sorry, New York and New Jersey, but welcome to the West coast every freaking season. Now all of a sudden it's all of a sudden it's really real, right? With that being said, I cannot stress to you enough how these wildland firefighters are extremely underappreciated and extremely underpaid because I was one of them. Yeah. So hopefully things will start to change here pretty soon. But uh, if you want to support changes, meaningful changes on the ground for these uh, men and women that are fighting the wildfires, I mean, they got families they got to go home to. They got bills to pay. They got all that stuff. Go over to grassrootswildlandfirefighters.com and check out the uh, TIMS Act. TIMS Act is going to be like the linchpin of how we're going to change this stuff on the ground. Maybe not the fuel situation. That's mother nature. That's a whole other story. But Go support Tim's Act because we need these people paid. We need these people taken care of and we need all of this stuff to be taken care of so we can actually keep continuing to put these fires out. Go check it out. It's in the news. Yeah, good stuff. Anyways, today on the show, we're going to have a special guest on today. Uh, we He is a health and nutrition coach and... He's got some pretty cool philosophies. Yeah. He's a former army veteran and West Point grad, and he is a nutrition and health coach. And he's got some pretty cool stuff to say on this uh, whole episode today. And uh, yeah, he just kind of recently made some life changes and he's cruising around the country working remotely out of his van. It's pretty cool. Interesting stuff. But with that, I would like to introduce my good friend, Paul Trahina. Welcome to the Anchor Point. Enjoy. Full move without the headphones. I like it. I dig it. <laughs> I can still hear you. I can hear myself. Exactly. I just got to monitor, man. Make sure that shit's not like messed up. But anyways, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Anchor Point Podcast. Today on the show, I have nutritional... <laughs> you got me again. <laughs> nutritional therapist and health coach, Paul Torina. What get up? That is it. Yeah, you got there it. We go. There you we go. You got it. Yep. There we go. Oh, welcome back, man. So... Tell us about yourself, man. Oof. Yeah. Where where to start? <laughs> Wherever you want, man. Um, yeah. Um, uh, nutritional therapy and health coach. I've been doing this over 10 years now. Love my life. Like love sharing my message mm-hmm. of uh, uh, my version of nutrition and, and different health practices. And I've um, been doing it over 10 years. Had a, a really thriving practice in Las Vegas and then um, ended up off grid. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, dude. Yeah, I just ended up off grid. I mean, there's a series of things that kind of led to that, but mm-hmm. um, but yeah, I just I love my life helping people and teaching people these things that I feel like are absolutely crucial for happiness. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, it's that whole thing that's that that whole body wellness. And I think that's kind of been one of those like uh, I guess pivot points of why we're here I mean, with the BLM and the preseason meeting. We're focusing a lot. They are focusing. I'm, I'm I been like I'm still employed by them, but I'm not. But it's cool to be back here and see like this total wellness program being implemented and not necessarily force fed on people, but like, Hey, these are some tools, Give some options. Yeah. Some people can attend whatever the heck they want. Yeah. It's great because, well, I mean, everyone acknowledges how, um, I mean, what they want is for these people to show up at their best on mm-hmm. job 
Yeah. But then also show that they're best at home because as you were saying before, like they're under a lot of stress and Mm -hmm. and their time at home is limited and they want that to be the best quality it can be too. So you got to freaking, a better you is better for everything else that you care about in your life. Oh yeah. So the rising tide raises all ships. It's even better for the people that maybe not necessarily are taking care of themselves. Like they'll look at you as a, a leadership example and they can, you know, pull their head out of their ass, so to speak, and, you know, raise, raise themselves up just by being in your presence. And that's like, yeah. that's like passive leadership that we don't really talk about. Right. Yeah. It's walking the walk, you yeah. know, like leadership by example. Yes, exactly. You want right. to look like a fucking badass. You want to fucking feel amazing, look amazing, act amazing, you know, be amazing. And, and it's, it's contagious. It, it is. is. Especially when it's wrapped in positivity too. It's like, that's like, and not arrogance. Yeah. Right? yeah. Like I, I, I love David Goggins, right? David Goggins has got a cool message, right? However, sometimes that message is so goddamn in your face and, and aggressive. And abrasive. Like he went off on this rant the other day, uh, just like a back and forth with some of his ex buddies. And yeah. just like, yeah, I don't like hearing the drama. You know? Yeah. No I one like, gives a shit about that, dude. Yeah, I like hearing the hardcore. Here's what to do. Get up, you know, bust your ass. I like that kind of stuff. Yeah. But, the stay hard motherfuckers. That's, yeah, that's, the, yeah. that's the motivation, right? Because we've all seen your story. We've all like looked at where you were, what you went through, what you became and who you are now. And that's inspiring, man. Keep it positive though. Yeah. Like, yeah, you tell some uncomfortable truths about human performance. Like there's no shortcuts. You have to put the work in. You have to back it up with nutrition, with all this other stuff, man. And it's, 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 everybody's looking for a shortcut. However, the drama and like the aggressiveness about it, it doesn't seem like it's like the positive flavor that I'm necessarily looking for, Yeah. but it still has value to me. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So health and wellness, it's like a buzz term, right? And what does that mean to you? I mean, is it a catch-all? It's like health coach, it's, or clinician. We were kind of having this conversation off camera and off topic or off, off, off recording. Yeah. It's, there's a lot that goes into that. So what does it mean to you? Man, so it's another loaded question, but um, I guess it's a way to group the most important, from my perspective, a way to group the most important things that people need to focus on. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of people are seeking to get better, you know, improve their fitness or their nutrition. Like they know they need to make a change. And so I guess a health coach is, is a great place to go because it's someone that's like, you know, kind of versed in different areas versus one specific area, you know, but the main areas for me are usually, uh, uh, nutrition and, and I'm leaning more towards calling it animal based nutrition, which is not carnivore, but, um, but nutrition is a huge piece of it. Sleep. Like I was here talking to the uh, BLM fire about, uh, fitness and, uh, personal quiet time. I think those would be the top four things that if people really worked on those things and dialed them in, like their life would be completely different Mm -hmm. in a good way. Are we talking like the personal quiet time kind of like reflection or stoicism? Like, well, starting, I call it personal quiet time just to uh, ease people into it. I'm, I'm a huge fan of meditation and mindfulness. And, um, but, but just getting in the habit of setting some time aside for yourself every single day, because most people don't, mm-hmm. most people get up and it's just all systems go. I mean, you got freaking two <laughs> young kids and, oh, yeah. and you got job responsibilities, you have a relationship. So if you don't carve out a little bit of time for yourself, um, and you can do whatever you want in that time. You're not going to have it once the day starts. Yeah. You know, it's like, uh, I have a hard time when I get up and if I like wake up in the middle of the night, I'm like on go mode. I don't know if that's like a crossover from like when I was firefighting and like some shit that I've carried through my, not my entire life. Before fire, I was not like that. Right. But nowadays, if I wake up at like three in the morning, say there's like, I don't know, windstorm and it wakes me up and I, I just can't fucking go back to sleep because yeah. I got to be productive. I yeah. got to go do shit. And it's great though, because if, even though I'm asked out tired at the end of the day, because I've been up since three in the morning, I may have gotten like four or five hours, three hours of sleep, right? That time, that personal quiet time, bef- my kids are asleep. I get a like, I don't know, from three to five in the morning before the kids are up, I get to do whatever the fuck I want. And it's like empowering. It's like, I can do whatever I want. You got to have solitude. I mean, what you're saying is, um, or it sounds like what you're saying is Mm -hmm. that like the quiet time is important to you, even though you're getting it at a suboptimal time where you should be sleeping, but, um, but still you, you you see the value in it. And Mm -hmm. then also separate from that also sounds like, I think all of us have to have solitude. Like we have to have some time. I mean, how many people, including yourself uh, probably, but like when I talk to, uh, uh, one person in a couple and they're like, you know, my, my wife's taking off for the weekend. So excited. Cause I get the place to myself and then vice versa. Like, mm-hmm. you know, the other partner would say that too. And it's not because they don't like each other or don't enjoy being around each other, but sometimes we just need time to ourselves. You know? Yeah. 
And you, you, you lose that, especially when you start having a family and you have kids and you got a professional career, or you're a mid-level professional, or you got all this tertiary, tertiary like shit going on in your life. It's like random access memory in a computer. Pretty soon your computer is going to be slow as hell because you have 900 browser tabs open on your Google, yeah. right? Yeah, it's a good analogy. Yeah, but you got to, I probably just agree on what's important and, and then schedule those things in or build them into it, you know? Health yeah. could be a big piece of it, but then having some solitude or some time, you know, where you're just um, doing your own thing. I don't know. I'm not a relationship expert. I'm just saying, you know, reflecting back to what you were saying, like the quiet time is important and and some kind of solitude, you know, yeah. like it's super beneficial because mm -hmm. most people just can't find that unless they actually block it out in a day. And then, um, you know, I would say that what, what's beneficial to practice within that quiet time at some point, even though in the beginning, I just try to get people used to or cultivate the habit of showing up to some kind of a, this is just me time. Um, you know, you could do devotion, you could do some kind of journaling or something, but I think meditation really, really crucial yeah. at some point. And that's the thing is like me practicing meditation. I'm freaking horrible about it. I, I'll try and do it, but that like that me time, that, that, that quiet time, so to speak, it's me trying to be productive and like yeah. do shit that like is involved with the podcast. It's like yeah. passion projects or yeah. it's like, I don't know if I get an hour or two and the, the kids go to the store, it's like, I'll go like go garden. I love gardening, man. I love growing my own stuff and eating it. That's cool. Um, or like my woodworking projects, I build fly fishing nets, like custom fly fishing nets. They're I, I'm like proud of them. Like they're, they're fucking cool. It's a passion of mine. Right. Mm -hmm. I had I, that, that alone time that you're talking about. That's, that's what I focus on. And some of it's meditative, like the building processes, like the productive and the creation elements to that. I guess that would be a form of meditation in my eyes, but it's not really mindfulness and meditation because I'm like basically distracting myself by doing shit. Yeah. Well, there's value in both, you know, like mm -hmm. you're, you're saying that like that solitude, you get things done that you otherwise couldn't get done. Precisely. Right. So there's that. And mm -hmm. then there's, you know, the practice of meditation and what you would do during a quiet time. And and I feel like just in this modern world, it's almost like we have to, or, or, you know, it's beneficial to make this a part of our life. Whereas maybe in a less stressful time, less modernization, you know, less distractions, and maybe we didn't need it as much, you know, but, True. but the way that our, our modern chaotic life is now, I think just blocking out some time for yourself because you're not going to do it otherwise. Super useful. Well, I mean, think of how many distractions that we have in our lives, right? And you're you're telling me about like how liberating it is to just like go off grid. And like, if you want us to tell the story about why you did that and made those decisions, by all means, take it away, dude. But oh, I yeah, think it's got to be it. like super liberating, man. Yeah, it's got to it be. It is. You're okay. removing distractions. Well, right? I mean, have you ever done like a minimalist challenge where you try to get rid of shit in your house? <laughs> A lot of people <laughs> listening probably have, you know, like I've the tried. minimalist, you know, they have this thing, you get one uh, rid of one item the first day, two items the second day, you try to do that for a whole month and it gets really challenging at the end. Here you go. I've tried to do it, but it was out of necessity because I was fucking poor. <laughs> to sell stuff. Or I was like yeah. a, a nomadic firefighter, you know, yeah. I was doing my academy yeah. shit. So it was like a forceful thing. Like yeah. I had to be nomadic and I had to be minimalist. But it feels good to get rid of stuff. It does. It feels it does. so good to get rid of stuff, yeah. you know, because... I don't know, man. I, I just feel like, you know, the, where we're at in this modern society, especially uh, we're at this, um, this convergence and the, uh, something's, I feel you, I'm sure you feel it too, right? Something's about to happen. Something's the about to break. Ink. It's the fucking ink. Uh, yeah. yeah. It, it's something is about to break in general, right? Yeah. It's this compilation of just poor health and just this consumer mindset and accumulating things, chasing happiness, yeah. looking for happiness. And, um, and that, I feel like that's why simplicity, minimalism, uh, whittling things down is, is so liberating for most people because it makes you realize what's really important, you know? Yeah. Most it's, people chasing happiness and look for happiness, they're not ever going to find it, including myself. I mean, that was myself until, you know, I realized that happiness is a byproduct of the things that I'm trying to teach people, which is animal-based nutrition, ancestral-based health practices, mm -hmm. simplified living. And when you put those things into practice, you're happier by nature mm -hmm. automatically. You're not seeking it anymore. It doesn't make you happy. It's not a silver bullet, but I think anyone listening, if you just sit and think for a second, if, like if you had your freaking nutrition figured out hundred percent, you had ultra confidence in it and it was giving you the results that you want. If you had your sleep figured out, if you had your fitness figured out, if you had some personal quiet time, if you learned to meditate and if you had minimal possessions, minimal bills, optimized processes, for most people, that feels really, really good. Yeah. And so regardless of what your life situation is, you have those things in place. You're going to be happier no matter what. 100%, man. And But it's, it's like so easy to fall into that trap of like 
falling into those distractions, right? And like, it feels good to buy like the nice pair of boots or whatever you're into, right? Like shit, fire boots cost $600, man, but it's a necessity. Well, it's, and it's a personal decision it with is. each one of those it items, is. you know, but yeah. it's like moving into this mindset of really scrutinizing, do I really need that? A need versus or, want. Or, or maybe, maybe you really want it, but you got to sit with it for a little bit versus yeah. just, you know, the you know, Amazon, right? You just freaking click by, click by, click by, you know, it's like having yeah. uh, an intention with it. You know, I think it's a very personal, customized, the, the mindset around simplicity and, and um, minimizing things is very, very personal. There, there's no rule about, you know, you should have a certain number of things, and, but it's most people just don't have that um, intention and that awareness with things they're purchasing and things they're chasing after. Yeah. Well, I mean, even look at like Amazon, for instance, right? It's so easy, right? It almost incentivizes impulsivity. And it's a it kind of like, oh, they click. know what the heck they're doing. Oh yeah, of yeah. course they do. It's no different than doom scrolling, like shit posts on Instagram. Right. And it like it, it there's algorithms <clears throat> that track your stuff. Like you track your cookies, it tracks your behaviors, it tracks what you like, and it just keeps feeding you this crap. So if you feed yourself shit, it's going to spit out more shit. You become a turd sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> that makes sense? Yeah. It's the truth though. But if you like remove 90% of the distractions and this consumerism and this, and you add intent and intention behind every action that you do and you're very purposeful in your directions or your, the direction that you want to go. I think that's empowering, man. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, think about it. most people, most people are not happy most of the time. Yeah. Well, that's happiness just, is, condi is, it's conditional, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's circumstantial. Yeah. But, but, um, if, if, you know, again, anyone listening, if you, if you just, if you're really honest with yourself, most people are not happy most of the time. Mm -hmm. And a big part of it is their personal health. And then the chaos of this modern world, mm -hmm. which a lot of it is possessions, apps, freaking chasing money, spending money. Like it's just, you know, you take all that stuff away and simplify things. And there's just, um, yeah, you know, a relative happierness that comes with it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think uh, there's a thought experiment out there that uh, I forgot. I, know it was, I experienced it in fire, but uh, it was like the difference between happiness, bliss, and contentness, right? It's, there's my buddy Booze, he's all about like the intention words and like, like, the, like how words are meaningful, very meaningful. I think we, that's great too. Yeah, yeah. It's great, dude. He's super heady, philosophical dude. I love the guy, right? But, uh, He'd probably, probably jive with this, but I heard somewhere, it wasn't from him, but I heard somewhere it's like happiness is conditional. It's, it's circumstantial. It's, it's fleeting almost. You're chasing happiness, but what about a state of bliss? What about content being, being content? I mean, it's not wrong to be content. It's like, oh yeah. no, shit, I'm good. No, yeah. I'm good. That's all I need. That's totally fine. I need. Well, I, I mean, that's like a higher level of being, right? Yeah. Just to actually realize that it's okay. Like once I have these things figured out that make me happy or what I think makes me happy or contributes to happierness, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's totally fine if I can be happy with where you're at. Yeah. It's totally cool. <laughs> you don't have to keep chasing and doing, you know, yeah. I've, I've always said, um, and I've said this in a lot of my talks over the years that at some point, uh, you know, I would love to just go somewhere that I've always wanted to go like somewhere in Europe and just, wash dishes and just go from city to city, making a basic paycheck, no responsibilities whatsoever. As long as I have real food and I can work out and I can sit in quiet time every day and get my sleep, like I'll be freaking happy. You know, like having these basic things in place, like that makes me content. Oh yeah. And for the higher folks that are listening out there, they can probably relate to this. If I were like, I guess if I were to make that comparison to wildfire, right? Same kind of concept, but if you're higher in your career and you're dragged down by this administrative duties, this, this leadership expectations, all this shit, all this, all the noise and background shit, and you get a detail because someone needs a hand and you're the last tool, no radio, so to speak. And yeah, it's like a phrase, right? You have like zero responsibilities, but you're at like a GS eight or nine or seven or whatever. And you have all these responsibilities over here on your home unit, on your engine or your crew or your helicopter or whatever. And then you go and detail with these folks and you have no responsibility. That is like such a so bleak. Oh it my God. So it's like, yeah, it feels oh, so good. I can, yeah. I can fucking breathe. Or like, you know, I'm used to giving seminars and mm -hmm. talking in front of people. And then when I get to sit and just attend the seminar, it's like, cool. this is great. <laughs> like, hey, I'm not doing this yeah. and I'm enjoying this. Right. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. What, what was the uh, thought, thought, train of thought there? It was, um, Oh, the contentment piece. Yeah, yeah the contentment, contentment piece. Yeah. yeah, I think.
but it's, it's getting to that point because most people are not there. You know, most people are, are they just, and, and when I say most people, it's not, it's not a judgment because I am, was still working on it all the time. Most people are not there. Mm-hmm. And they don't, they don't even really realize or understand what it is that makes them happy. But what I'm saying is if you can focus on these basic things, you're going to be happy by nature. Yeah. It's a byproduct of these things. It's and then, those higher grade needs, man. Yeah, absolutely. And then, and it is. And then, um, once you get these things in place, you have realizations about what is important to you. You know, like I can't even tell you how many times, like I've, I've had clients that I work with and, and we get these foundations uh, figured out and they're like, you know what? I'm not happy where I'm at. I'm not happy with my job. I'm not happy in my relationship, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and there's like an awakening that happens. And, and it hap- I feel like this foundation of health and simplicity is the catalyst for a lot of great things that can happen in people's lives. The and whole, without that, I can't imagine what life would be like, you know? Yeah. It's like the whole, uh, striving versus thriving kind of mentality, right? Once you start thriving, truly thriving, you're just like, look at the like meteoric rises and like what they perceive as success, right? What is success? What is like the things that make you content and happy and all that stuff? And it's like, you're truly thriving if you're cutting out the bullshit and you're taking care of your base needs, yeah. right? Well, and then that question, what is it that makes people happy? You know, and people ask that question all the time. And what's mm-hmm. my purpose? That's a big and, one. Right. And it's like. I've just come to this realization and there's, there's a lot of different thinking around it, but you don't have to have that figured out. No. Like all you have to do is focus on these things. And again, you, you have this awakening, maybe your a purpose, which you could have a bunch of different purposes mm-hmm. and it can change over a lifetime. You know, they present themselves to you. Like it's, it's just, it's strange how it happens, but I feel like this is a rediscovery of the way that we were meant to be. And it starts with these basic foundational principles. Yeah. It's like you found purpose in what you do right now, right? With the seminars and your practice and everything like that. I found purpose in this and sharing and storytelling and all that other stuff. But we had multiple purposes and also people change and it's okay. You can, you can change your mind. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. You can do something different if you want to. Like, I'm over this. I don't know. I'm going to go wash dishes in Europe and have a basic paycheck and have my basic needs. And no made. responsibility. And no last tool, no radio, man. And it's okay. It's just, you got to figure it out, man. But if, if you're struggling with that, you know, that, you know, I just don't know what to do. What do I, you know, like do these basic things yeah. and you'll be blown away at how life presents itself to you and opens up. Oh yeah. Everything gets better. Well, it's like manifesting, right? If you put out good, typically good's going to come back. And yeah. I'm one of those people love it or hate it when I say these words, but I'm, I'm a little bit woo woo. Air quotes. There. Again, like we were saying before, conspiracy is no longer conspiracy. Yeah. Most conspiracies have been tr- proven to be true. So yes. woo-woo is no longer woo-woo. It's yeah. probably, there's some validity to it. You yeah. know? It's like sound therapy. Well, I mean, what's, is, is there science? And they're finding out that there may be, may be possible science behind it. It's like uh, psilocybin assisted therapy, psychotherapies, right? Or MDMA assisted uh, trauma therapy for first responders, military. That shit works. And it's been outlawed for how many years? Yeah. Yeah, it, they actually have data and proof that it works. And yeah, it, it's it's just the things that we, I guess, throw out and discount just because it's not within our social acceptance or cultural acceptance. It's not couth, right? So there's a lot of shit out there. Oh, we don't think it's going to give us the results that we want. You know? yeah. There's no way it could be that simple. I hear that a lot too, like with a lot of the stuff that I teach. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody's looking for a complicated answer. Sometimes like we were talking before, something science-based, you know, yeah. and- if it works for you, it works for you. You got to give it a shot. Yeah. You know, it's like the whole, uh, like the conversation I had with Walker here earlier, uh, the, before we started recording with you, it's like, he literally is at the lowest point in his life and he is going through some shit. He had all this noise and all these distractions and all this stuff. His needs weren't being met. Right. And he finally had the courage to reach out for some help. And he found help in fucking crystals and the woo woo and like the, the energy healing stuff. And it's changed his life. The dude literally had a gun in his mouth at one point and he mm. was like five seconds away from pulling the trigger. Oh. It saved his life. It works for him. If you're going to say, Oh, that's too dumb. Cause it's woo woo. Right. It's not science based. It worked for him. Shut the fuck up. Yeah. Yeah. I, we're getting off on a tangent yeah. here, but <laughs> give it a shot and give it a shot. If it works for you, it works for you. Yeah. So let's talk nutrition, man. Speaking like base yeah, knees, I, dude, I, I, will, I just nerd out because I am. My I buddy, my buddy is going to be listening to this. And he always says, what does he say? You got to land the plane. He's like, a lot of times we speak in generalities. Yeah. He's like, so if you get a chance, land the plane, talk specifics. All right. So I'm super excited to talk about nutrition. Go nuts. Like go nuts, <laughs> well, dude. Because you have any specific, like what would be the most, since most people watch, listening to this are firefighters, yeah. right? Yeah. Or, um, what would be the most useful thing to talk about in that area? 
So I could talk for hours and hours and hours about it. Okay. So some topics that I kind of want to explore is like availability of quality nutrition. Cause you're on the road, you're eating MREs. I mean, you're a veteran, you know, the turd sandwiches that you have to eat sometimes. Yeah. So optimizing that kind of like looking around for like better choices to meet your needs. If or, you're, if you're planning your food, yeah. right. Things yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, we can talk supplements if you want to go there. I'm I kind of indifferent about supplements. Uh, I, if you need hey, them, they it, work for you. They I was work gonna for say you. if it works for you, it works for you. Yeah, you know, if you and, need and it. Yeah, there's some good logical reasons for certain things, but yeah, if we start with the the basics of food. Mm -hmm. um, so you're saying uh, from a practical standpoint, you know, yeah. how do I plan? How do I? Because MREs are full of crap. Yeah, you know? yeah, they fill you up though. It's yeah. got a lot of calories. It's yeah. calorie dense. Yeah. Um, man, I remember in the army, like trading different things in our packets to make different concoctions. They still have those, like the, oh, yeah. the ranger pudding. Oh and yeah. All the, okay. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. get like the uh, sliced apples, the crackers. <sighs> we, didn't and, have, we weren't that advanced. Yeah. No? Yeah. Oh yeah. man. All right. Here's the thing though. Quick question. What? Do you know what a rat fucker is? No. It's the person that goes into the box of MREs and like oh, cherry picks. Oh yeah. Everybody hates a rat fucker. Don't be a rat fucker. Yeah. No, and this is, this is a uh, voluntary trading yes. we're talking about for yeah, components okay. of it. Yeah. Gotcha. But yeah, so I have in my cooler right now, um, I got an electric cooler mm -hmm. and in my cooler right now, I've got four tubes of burger patties from Costco mm -hmm. and I've been out here seven days. I haven't had to go to the store for anything. <laughs> you know? It's yeah. like, so one thing that you could, uh, maybe in this idea around planning, right? Like what are the most nutrient dense foods that I could possibly stock up on? That's, that would be the question, right? Because yeah. what's the purpose of eating in the first place is to give your body nourishment and nutrition. Mm -hmm. You also want to create energy in a specific way. You know, I'd recommend that people be metabolically flexible, which is energy flexible, or you can create energy from fat and glucose and uh, create energy in different ways internally. Um, but if you can acknowledge like, what, what is, what is the point of me eating in the first place? What is this supposed to do for me? Yeah. It's supposed to help me build my body, nourish my body, contribute to the functions of my body. Recovery. And then say again, recovery. Yep. And that's part of the building process, right? When you say recovery, like I'm assuming like from physical exercise, yeah. fatigue, you know, cumulative stress, yep. physical stress. Yeah. Oh yeah. That stuff wears you out. Um, so what are the foods that are going to do that? I mean, it's not lettuce. <laughs> No, you know what I mean? No, it's not. It's, It'll uh, help you poop. And, and there's, and <laughs> there's nothing MRE again, I'm not, there's ago. nothing against that. I'm just saying when you think about it, say what's the most valuable thing that I can take with me or plan for, it's the thing that's going to nourish me the most. Yeah. And I would say animal foods are top priority, always, 100%. Okay. Because animal foods give us everything that we need to do everything that we need to do because we are an animal. Yeah. You know, like if I, if I want to build muscle, if I want to build my bicep, what's the best thing to eat? Probably a steak. Yeah. Because that is steak. Yeah. That is a direct source. That's a direct path to exactly what this needs. And if I take that bigger, what does this animal need to facilitate this animal? Yeah. Animal foods are where it's at. Well, you're an apex predator by nature, right? By biology. I mean, that's one of the things that's been proven over and over and over. Yeah. You know? And there's also a lot of uh, nutrients that you can't get in eating lettuce. I just, I'm just say it. Well, right? I'd say lettuce is pretty nutrient deplete, but, but plants in general just don't give us, uh, like the protein load, the bioavailable protein load. Um, there's specific nutrients in animal foods that we're just not ever going to get from plants. Yeah. And there's nothing that we absolutely, I'm, and I'm not anti-plants. Like I know I sound like I am right now. No, not at all, man. I consider myself like an, an, um, animal based nutritional therapist and animal based just basically means that they are priority. Yeah. They have to be embraced. And then within that, you can have as much balance as you want. Like I'm, I'm a big fan of carbohydrates from good starch sources and fruits and healthy things fats. like that. Yeah. Healthy fats, you know, which usually, you know, when you think about it, if you eat animal foods or really what we are is we're protein centric mm -hmm. within the animal foods realm, right? So it's like, if I eat something that I know is going to give me a good pop of protein, I'm not just getting protein from it. Like when you eat a steak, you're getting protein, but you're also getting all the fatty acids that come with it, vitamins, minerals. Like it's like, it's a package of a lot of great stuff. So focusing on animal foods, I think is if we came back to like, you know, planning for, um, being on a fire line or, uh, what would be some other situation? Someone goes away for two weeks or something like that at a time, right? Yeah. Sometimes. Right. Yeah. So if it's me and I'm looking to source foods to bring with me, or if I'm in a pinch and I have to hit a gas station or a grocery store, hundred percent, it's always going to be protein based animal foods. Okay. And we're not talking bars, right? Obviously we're not talking about that. I mean, we're depends. talking about jerky. If, I, if I'm at a, 
Oh, you mean bars like a like protein bars or something? Like protein bars and shit yeah. like that, right? Well, there's, have you seen the Epic Meat Bars? Oh, those things are delicious. Yeah, man. they're meat bars. Yeah, they don't taste like shit either. They're yeah. super good. Yeah, Epic yeah. Meat Bars, Chomps, Meat Sticks, uh, Paleo Valley. There's a ton of them, you know? So so those are options. Beef jerky is an option, yeah. you know, if you're in a pinch. Okay. So back to like what's priority? Again, what is going to nourish you the most? What's going to give you the most uh, bang for buck? It's always going to be animal foods. So it's kind of like the amount of nutrition that's density wise, like the amount of animal nutrition, the, the proteins, the good, the more fats, the fats that you're getting in. And, all right. Let's, let's side note, rabbit hole. Let's talk about fat for a minute. I mean, we have like vilified fats in nutrition in America for so goddamn long. And well, animal fats and saturated fats. fats. Yeah. Specifically. But they're like absolutely critical for the functionality of our body it's like hormone regulation and production it's it's like the lubricants in between your joints it's like it's everything Good job, man. Yeah, it's yeah. yeah we well we are animal fats yeah. <laughs> that's what we're made of literally. exactly yeah yeah no it's you know uh, that is such archaic information the whole saturated fat cholesterol heart disease mm -hmm. uh animal foods or uh, uh animal proteins cause cancer like it's just so archaic but it's still so prevalent um, but I mean, more and more, it's like a grassroots movement, like more and more people are becoming more and more aware of the power of being protein centric and animal food centric and understanding that these fats are actually extremely helpful for you because this is exactly what I'm made of. We're not made of fucking canola oil and <laughs> right. We're not We're made not. of, I mean, even, even though we use these things sometimes avocado oil or coconut oil, I mean, those are fine to use, but animal fats are where it's at, man. Yeah. And something about like the richest that taste when you add like, like beef tallow, for instance, man. Amazing. Or duck or, fat. Or butter. Or butter. Even, butter. 95% yeah. of the uh, majority of what we cook is butter based unless we have access to some really good tallow. Yeah. And you can make your own tallow and you can use pork fat. You can use like bacon grease if you want some like smoky flavor in there or whatever. And you can use these things. And I think that it's a, like a lost art. Like it's almost like we've lost some of the like baseline homesteading kind of like tribal knowledge in our society absolutely like, like making tallow or yeah, clarified yeah, butter or yeah. like preserving shit even yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah useful cool. skills to, to try to go back to yeah um but yeah that'd be the number one piece of advice you know you're sourcing planning your foods um probably uh, trying to be protein centric because protein is what your body needs you know you're out there working your ass off on a fire line right the calorie expenditures calorie extreme. expenditure and and the breakdown of your body mm -hmm. what's the best thing for it Protein. Animal foods. Yeah. yeah. Protein coming from animal foods because you're not just getting the protein. You're getting all the fats and connective tissue and vitamins and minerals. And what's better, that or some carrot sticks? You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? I'd take a ribeye any day. But I'm not, I'm not against carrot sticks either. But yeah. yeah. And that's another thing too is like um, it's just the the – you said it best yourself. I mean the revolution of like becoming aware of these things and like how we've been misled by science, air quotes there. And it's all bullshit. It's, it's, it's all been, uh, like really paid for studies and like, look at the, look, look at the nutritional pyramid in the United States. Yeah. It starts with bullshit, like fruits or like grains, dude. Why is that the base? Yeah, oh, because they need to sell it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you're in the know, man. I don't know about it, that. It's uh it's, it's propaganda. It like is. I, I, at this point I'm convinced that it's been a deliberate move to weaken this population so that we're more controllable. Hmm. because there's people that understand and know yeah. that you shouldn't be eating some of the things that are in processed foods. You know what I mean? They yeah. should, most of those things shouldn't even be allowed on shelves. No, it's, it's fucking carcinogens. Yeah. It's like you're eating one molecule away from plastic in some cases. Right. Yeah. But then who makes those decisions and whoever makes those decisions, it's like, yeah, it's, um, if you want to re rebirth yourself, <laughs> Embrace animal foods. Animal mm -hmm. foods are where it's at. Yeah. The whole vilification thing though, too, and that lied to that, that, that propaganda thing. It's like, it's like masculinity. I mean, there's good, bad, or indifferent. It has its purposes, right? You were a warrior at one point in your life. You probably still are in some degree, right? Um, it's like that quote by, I think it was Mike Tyson that was saying is like, you know, you don't understand how much violence I've had to experience to become this docile. Mm. Holy shit gives me chills, wow. but it's like, yeah. It's like masculinity in itself. It's been vilified, right? And that weakening the 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 culture, the the society as a whole. And it's like down to our nutrition and it, that can shining it back into the conspiracy bullshit, right? I don't necessarily think it's conspiracy, but it's fun to entertain. But 
maybe it's a byproduct of like the blind leading the dumb and or the uneducated not necessarily dumb but just they just have no frame of reference they don't know the general population doesn't know this shit about our nutri nutrition or the purpose of masculinity or the purpose of this that and the other and how it fits into a society right i think i think everything has been captured by money and power yeah. right and and because it's all been captured it's influenced not by truth but by making more money yeah, that's it. Shareholder so, interests. You know, so this, the you know, this, um, the demonization of saturated fats, animal foods, it's been happening for a really long time. Mm -hmm. We're worse off health wise than we've ever been in our entire existence. So it hasn't worked. You yeah. know, when I go to the grocery store and I see people's grocery carts, uh, they're not loaded up with steak and eggs and butter. Mm -hmm. Like they're actually, they have very minimal of those things. And yet that same person is inflamed and on a fistful of medication. So it's not the meat, it's not the butter, it's not the eggs, it's all the other BS. But, yeah. but it's not their fault, it's not our fault because this is the information we've been fed. But it's just, at some point you have to, we have to wake up and say, this is not working. You know, mm -hmm. this advice is not working. It's like, uh, if anything, we should be vilifying. I think it's sugar. I mean, look at like the new research that's been coming out about like type three diabetes, like the little dark the, corner of science over here. That's not being peer reviewed because no one wants to accept it, but it's got legitimate data. Alzheimer's? Yeah. Alzheimer's yeah. 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 and dementia, yeah. I think too. Yeah. Right? Both of them? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. They, could, they In some ways it could be considered like uh, metabolic diseases of the brain. So. Yeah. It's an insulin resistance in your brain. That's, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here. You're the pro here, but... It, is that, is that, yeah, is that yeah, correct? Yeah. So then the right? question is what contributes to insulin resistance and it's a factor for sure. And there's, there's genetic components, but, mm -hmm. um, yeah, insulin resistance. Well, carbs used to be like the demon for a while. I feel yeah. like there's always been the shifting scapegoat, but, but saturated fat and meat have never gotten a break, you know, yeah. eggs have been vilified and then they're great again. And then vilified. And then, yeah. They're just like back and forth. But, um, but even insulin resistance, uh, it was thought to be like a big carb sugar thing. But now we know it's uh, it's inflammation, and there's several things that contribute to insulin resistance. It would uh, one of them would be just eating all the time. Like if you're snacking and grazing all day long, you're secreting insulin constantly, mm -hmm. right? Um, so that would be one thing to just be aware of. Like you don't want to graze all day; you want to have a couple of solid meals, and that's about it. Um, uh, carbohydrates and sugar can have an impact, but if you're only eating a couple times a day and you have some carbs with those meals, it's not a big deal. Yeah. Types and source matter, you know, but then those industrial seed oils, like the highly processed plant-based oils, like can canola oil and soybean oil, like those inhibit the body's ability to use fat for fuel and it makes someone more carb dependent. So those three main things, you know, uh, frequency of meals, uh, carbohydrates, maybe too much or from the wrong sources. And then those highly processed plant-based oils, you know, those are the things that would contribute. You pull any one of those levers or you pull back on any one of those and you'll start to see some improvements. And a lot of the clients that I work with that are pre-diabetic, diabetic, diabetic um, I never even tell them to go low carb. They don't mm -hmm. have to. They just pull out all those crappy oils and they stop eating so often and they focus on protein, uh, animal-based nutrition, and everything fixes itself pretty quick. So what about talking about like behaviors of eating, right? Like, so, I mean, we use it as a comfort mechanism oftentimes. It's like... Yeah. If you eat like a, a fucking Snickers bar, it's like next to like, if you're like really craving the Snickers bar and you get that hit, it's like no different than taking a hit of heroin or yeah. for an addict, right? Yeah. And it becomes addictive, but a lot of things can become addictive, like even fitness itself. I've yeah. seen like CrossFit athletes, that's like all they do. And it's like, they get high. Oh, I was shit, there. Right? I, I've been there. Yeah. yeah. So let's talk about like nutritional habits in combination with like trying to source it and like breaking your bad habits, right? Okay. So maybe uh, you're talking a little bit about like um, your habituations and your urges and cravings and yeah. breaking through that, you know, trying to do the right thing. Right. Yeah. So again, if we come back to being kind of protein centric and animal food centric, right. A lot of those things that we're experiencing, it's physiological, mm -hmm. it's biological, right. When I have a craving or urge for something, I'm not making it up. It's not fake. I'm but, so glad you're going here, dude. Cause well, I'm, but yeah. a lot of us are like that though, mm -hmm. right? A lot of, we beat ourselves up because we feel like we have to have the willpower to resist. Yeah. Right. But it's, you again, it's not, it's not in your head. Like you're experiencing these cravings. And, and most of the time it's because people unintentionally, inadvertently, um, unconsciously, and because they've been given the wrong information their entire life, they're eating nutrient deplete foods and, or they are carb burners, you know, they're carbivores. And so when they don't eat all the time, their body's screaming for 
some some food when they don't eat nutrient dense foods their body is screaming for nutrition yeah. and when they don't eat frequently because their body's so used to having carbs so often they're screaming you know that's another reason that we have these hunger signals so hunger i would say hunger is a sign of nutritional deficiency and or toxicity and so if if we flip that or nutritional deficiency toxicity and energy deficiency right so mm -hmm. why am i hungry it's because my body's craving something so how do we flip that we eat nutrient dense foods. We stop eating so often and those cravings magically go away. Yeah. For most people, I'm not saying they completely go away, but that makes it way easier, you know? So just imagine getting up in the morning. Uh, this is what I had for breakfast today. I had four eggs and a, a third pound uh, beef patty. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have zero appetite right now. Yeah. Like you're good. Snicker bars are my favorite thing in the world. And you could put one in front of me right now. I have no interest in it whatsoever. Yeah. You don't need it. Yeah. So if you, again, if you focus on nutrient dense foods, this is just giving you, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, if you don't do this, then you're already battling so much, right? It's, it's a, it's a matter of willpower and beating mm -hmm. yourself up. But if you do this, at least you have a fighting chance and it makes things a lot easier. Very true. Okay. Here's a question for you. on like a biological signals thing. And like, I'm, I'm kind of, one of I, I guess you, you kind of alluded to it right there. It's like, that's a biological signal that you're deficient in something, right? Either a nutrient or a macro or whatever. Right. So it takes someone who's dialed in on you know, their nutrition yet. I don't know, maybe they're pregnant or something like that. And then they are craving fucking pickles and ice cream. Is that because it's like saying like your body is saying, Hey, I need whatever the hell is in this ice cream and pickles. Right. I get this question all the time. I, I'd so, love to so, know so your so opinion so on that. Because what you're saying is to say that, you know, Oh, so if I'm craving that, then my body's saying maybe I need that. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that, but it doesn't mean that if I'm craving like a muffin, my body needs the muffin. Okay. You know, my body's craving something. Right. And again, it probably boils down to some nutritional component or some energy component. And maybe that thing has a source of what, so, so if I, it's an energy thing, right? My body's craving some energy and it sends me these hunger signals and I want a Snickers bar. I want a muffin. It doesn't mean that that's the best thing for it to satisfy it. I could easily eat like a, a half a sweet potato or an apple or something like that. And I'd probably feel just as satisfied, you know, yeah. maybe not emotionally satisfied because I love that freaking thing. Well, there's a psychology element to eating the foods that we do. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 There's an enjoyment factor. But mm -hmm. to answer your question, it's like, it could mean that, but you know, again, if you get the basics dialed in, like you just don't have those situations happen that often. Yeah. You know, a lot of times when people have cravings and they, like you said, they're dialed in, if they're dialed in considered according to what I would consider to be optimal, and they're craving something, then maybe they're being too restrictive, you know, like, um, like women, especially around their menstrual cycle, they, they just have to be easy on themselves. They can't be hundred percent strict, hardcore, you know, super protein centric, relatively lower carb. They need to be easy on themselves around that period. And outside of that, there's a, it's game on, you know, they can be a lot more strict. Mm -hmm. Well, look at the hormone differences, like just, just strictly from a, a like a biological hormone difference in men and women. Right. And mm -hmm. I have the utmost respect for women firefighters because they have to put in two to three to even four times the amount of physiological effort to get the same amount of physiological output as a man does. And that's just biology. Have I seen women run circles around men in the field of hotshot crews on shit smoke jumpers? I've seen it and it's possible, but shout out to the ladies out there because you have to put in so much more. And that's just strictly from a hormone thing. Testosterone is a very powerful thing. But in that regard, we're talking about cycles. We're talking about hormones. Let's talk about like the whole, the, the, the meat centric, the meat based diet and its importance in hormones, because I've seen people out there with a meat based diet. And like I watched my buddy who was pre-diabetic. Actually, I'm going to go watch monster trucks with him tonight <laughs> with my sons and it's going to be great. But anyways, I watched him go from pre-diabetic to like 110 pounds overweight. And he went like to the hardcore mode of animal-based diets, right? Mm -hmm. He went strict off the couch, no bullshit into a uh, carnivore, right? Dude was like shredded, yoked, happy, all like dialed in, in a rapid amount of time. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm His not body was craving it. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> well, I mean, so the master hormone is mm -hmm. going to be insulin, right? Okay. And Which insulin's is not yeah. a bad thing at all. Mm -hmm. Master hormones, there's a couple of things I want to talk about here, but w one of them is that like insulin is the master hormone. If we can learn how to manage it and make it our friend, right? Because it needs to be secreted 
when you eat, you're going to secrete insulin. It's yeah. necessary because it tells your body how to store energy and use energy, store energy, use nutrients and store nutrients, right? So it's a necessary hormone. We just don't want it secreted all the freaking time, yeah. right? So, um, and then, of course, we already said that the highly processed plant-based oils have an impact and, and they make you more carb dependent. So if we pull those out, that's a big win. And then if we make sure our carbs are from real food sources in smaller amounts, and I'm talking, again, like uh, uh, half a sweet potato, a cup of rice, a piece of fruit or something like that. If we're doing those things, then we're taking control of that master hormone that has an impact on all the other hormones in the endocrine system. Mm -hmm. That's cascading effects like throughout your body. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. and then the other piece of that is uh, being protein centric or uh, animal based centric um, stimulates muscle protein synthesis. And, and you mentioned testosterone. Um, when I eat a certain amount of protein, first of all, I have a daily requirement for protein. Okay. Mm -hmm. All of us have a Everybody certain amount does. of muscle protein turnover. Um, where we're, our body is just cycling through amino acids because they're used for a lot of different functions inside the body. So there's a certain amount of turnover, turnover that needs to be uh, recouped. But then if I want to maintain muscle and I want to build muscle, I have to eat a certain amount of protein at my individual meals mm -hmm. because then my body's getting the signal of uh, – plenty, you know, like I've got so much stuff coming in, I'm going to make this person big and strong versus if things are skimpy, then the body's not going to have that signal. So, so there's a certain amount of protein everyone needs to get in a day. And then there's a certain amount of protein we need to eat at meals, big boluses of protein to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. So those are two things that come in mind when it comes to hormones. Like, you know, we want to control the master hormone and direct it as much as possible. And that means a couple meals a day for most, most of the people that I work with gravitate towards two meals a day. I'll eat um, two. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, Sometimes yeah. one, you know? Yeah. Well, I eat like a big ass dinner usually, which is probably my, should be my lunch meal, right? Really. But I don't know. I, I do the fasting thing too. And that's like just a, a thing that I'm used to. I don't eat breakfast. I drink a cup of coffee and I just go about my business. And I probably don't eat until like one, two, right? Yeah. And then it's a big ass dinner and I go to bed. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. sorry to interrupt. No, that's good. Um, so, uh, but anyway, you know, mastering insulin, directing insulin, two meals a day, protein centric, uh, smaller amount of carbs from real food sources, you know, taking out all the crap and processed foods and highly processed plant-based oils. And then as you're eating protein, just making sure you're getting a certain amount of protein in a day, making sure that your meals contain big protein pops. And it doesn't mean that you're not having vegetables and a little bit of starch, a little bit of fruit, but like that's got to be the centerpiece. It's got to be the main focus. And if you do that, then you're controlling insulin and you're building and maintaining muscle and strong bones and connective tissue and all the great things that come with that. Yeah. Your bone density is going up. Everything's going. Yeah, it's I mean, optimizing it. How do you get strong bone density? It's it's uh, strong muscles because yeah. they you know, correlate together. And having resistance training too, yeah. that plays a big huge, thing. Huge. Yeah. yeah. If you had to focus on anything in the fitness room, number one priority is resistance training and strength building. Oh my God. Thank you so much. Dude. Women, I, men, it doesn't matter. Yeah. I, 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 I'm so frustrated when, when people say that I don't want to do lifting because I'm afraid I'm going to get too bulky. I fucking hate that. Well, usually it's women saying that. And, and usually it and, is. Yeah. And, and in some ways it's a valid concern because you watch TV, especially, you know, a few years ago, you got the CrossFit games, you got all these huge jack freaking women, but yeah, but they're, they're I promise you, awesome. you can, you can work out as hard as you want, as long as you want. And you're never going to look like that. No, and for, they hit the genetic training, lottery, dude. Yeah. That's, they hit the genetic who knows, lottery. Who knows what else, but yeah. resistance Peaches. training for women is going to give women everything they want, which mm -hmm. is good posture, um, nice curvy butt, nice curvy legs, you know, like it's just, you know, an athletic looking person, whether yeah. it's man or woman is just, it's, they're going to be way more attractive. Oh yeah. And, and that's super functional. Yeah. And that's another thing too. It's like, everybody wants to get, look good naked, right? It doesn't matter if you're a male, female, whatever in between, or it doesn't matter. You want to attract a mate, whatever flavor of mate you want to go for. Right. And fitness and resistance training, that's like the core right absolutely. there. Right? In the fitness realm. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Resistance training is where it's at. Number one priority. Yeah. Cause I fucking hate people saying that, oh, I need to lose weight. And they just like run on a treadmill or just run, 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 run. They, they don't know happen. any better. They don't know any better. Yeah. That's, that's another, that's why I have so much compassion for so many people because I was there, you know, mm -hmm. um, most people, when they think about, Hey, I want to make a change or I want to lose some fat, like their mind goes to fitness and nutrition. Right. And the nutrition is so freaking confusing. Most people can't figure it out. There's right? a lot of bro science but, and bullshit. Yeah. And there's everything from vegan to carnivore and, and advocates and, and all spectrum, you mm -hmm. know. Um, and then the fitness realm, most people, unless they know, unless they're aware, first thing they do is start running or get on a treadmill. And the best thing that they could do is resistance training because it's building strength. It's building capacity, uh, functionality, muscle, and that's giving you the aesthetics that you want. Yeah. You know, I think that's primordial on this. The reason it looks good is because it's an indication of someone that's capable. Yeah. 
it's like that whole like warrior culture thing, like dating back to when we we're throwing rocks at each other, you know, it's the invention of fire. It's like, yeah. obviously that individual is fit. I want to seek them out as a mate, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a survival mechanism. And that's like just bred into us over eons of time. You know, yeah. we, you can't avoid that. Yeah. It's why it's attractive to us. Yeah. No, I a hundred percent agree. But that's another thing too, is like the, <clears throat> the, the, the grand science experiment with nutrition, like what your diet is, may not i mean the, the whole comment about lettuce right i mean that it's, it's that shit works for you specifically you have dialed in your nutrition specific to your needs whereas i might be a little bit different but it's still animal based i'm still animal based right i love yeah. a good oh, yeah. good ribeye but i might need something a little bit different so let's so explore that super bio individual right that's the the great thing about the way that i teach and work with people first of all i don't come out of the gate and say like you know i'm freaking hardcore animal based yeah. you know when i work with people they come to me wanting some help and they want help um, implementing better health practices and habits in their life and it doesn't matter what their goals are i'm gonna support them mm -hmm. like if i got a vegan that comes to me and they're dead set on being vegan, I'm going to help them be the best vegan they can, mm -hmm. you know? So like my buddy who's the hardcore carnivore and he lost a shit ton of weight and he optimized his body that worked for him. Right. Why well, wouldn't work for me? Yeah. yeah. So, so my first priority is, is, um, meeting this person where they're at and helping them achieve their goals, whatever they think they are. Now, obviously they're coming to me for some kind of guidance usually. Mm -hmm. So when the door opens for some education, then of course we have discussions around like what's best and what's optimal, but starting out, um, I have a, what I call uh, my definition of real food and it's animal foods, the traditional fats, vegetables and greens, full fat dairy if you tolerate it, starches and fruit and things like that, mm -hmm. right? So within that general guideline, you can gravitate towards whatever you want. You yeah, know, if you don't like steak, adventure. you can eat chicken. You know, if you you can eat fish. You know, if you're like, if you think that steak and red meat's bad for you for whatever reason, then you can gravitate towards eggs, chicken and fish. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. So within that realm... Um, you know, there's a lot of flexibility, um, a lot of, uh, uh, potential bio individual, uh, individuality for, uh, your personal preferences and things, but usually people start to gravitate towards what really makes them feel good. And most of my people that have been with me for an extended period of time, like we all do the same thing now or mm -hmm. something close to it. Something so, real similar, right? Yeah. Very, very similar, mm -hmm. which is protein centric, you know, animal based and, and then a little bit of vegetables and fruit and starch and things like that. But what was the question that got us here? I forgot. You said, let's dig into, Oh, the, what the, works for you. Yeah. yeah, the, yeah the individual thing. Yeah. yeah. So within this realm of real food, I think the first priority is just understanding real food has got to be my number one priority, regardless of what my thought is around what that actually means. Okay? It doesn't come in a box. <laughs> right. It's not typically. processed foods. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And there's some caveats to that, but, um, but then within the realm of real food, if you can just, again, if you can be protein centric mm -hmm. and understand this is the thing that's going to nourish the body the most, and then maybe let your personal preferences guide you with how you prepare those things and some of the ancillary foods like the vegetables and greens and things like that. And then just have some guardrails around the carbs. You know, you're done. If I'm eating uh, a meal of like a, a pound and a half of steak or uh, hamburger patties or something like that, I don't want to follow that up with three cups of white rice, you know, no. like, <laughs> but I can still have a little bit of white rice, yeah. you know? So yeah, it's, it's super flexible, super bio-individual. And, um, and the first priority is just getting out of the, the modern freaking uh, processed food realm and abiding by those basic principles of real food and then trying to gravitate towards being more and more protein centric. Mm -hmm. And so staying on the exterior of the supermarket, right? Yeah. Because all the bullshit is in the middle. Typically a good rule. Um, you know, something that does help us be a little bit more flexible and make this work in a modern lifestyle is if you understand how to read labels and ingredients, then you can find alternatives to the things that you think you have to give up, right? This so, is super important for the folks out in the field that can't have the, the stuff, right? Right. That's so available, yeah. right? Right. Yeah. yeah. Like yeah. examples like, you know, cookies, crackers, you know, ice cream, chips, you know, there's, I mean, they're, they're not great in large amounts, but if you get ones made with appropriate ingredients, they're perfectly fine in moderation and on occasion. Mm -hmm. And that can make things enjoyable, you know? So there's, Tortillas that are not made with freaking GMO corn and, you know, and uh, wheat and things like that. And those are appropriate for like a taco night. If the majority of the food you eat is real food and, and again, you're being protein centric and animal based, then um, it's totally fine to have some uh, flexibility with those, I guess, less than appropriate foods, but they're made with better ingredients. Yeah. It's like choosing the lesser of two evils. It's either you go for the turd or you go for like the slightly less turd. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But it's, it's like you're forced to make these decisions. Like me personally, I perform probably the best on uh, red meat, and especially wild game, man. Oh God, wild game just like, it feels like you're like on 
fucking crack and you're just going to town. Oh, it's right? good to hear you say that, man. It's, red, it, red, red meat is where it's at. Yeah. I mean, it, it really is. Um, man, I had a question from the, uh, from a client the other day about this, like, why is red meat so good for you versus these other things? And the reason she was asking is because she feels better on it. I do too. She's like, are you sure it's okay that I'm eating like hamburger meat every day? And I'm like, so we had this discussion around like, why is herbivore meat and ruminant meat so good for you? Because of their digestive systems. They have this ability to detoxify plants mm -hmm. and de pretty Cows much detoxify. Stomachs, man. That's right. Yeah. They have a, a very complex digestive system that ferments, right? So they detoxify everything, you know? Mm -hmm. So a lot of people will say, well, I can't afford grass fed, you know? Even conventional beef, yeah. like those animals detoxify everything that they eat so that their flesh becomes relatively toxin free. Even glyphosate is is um, is detoxified like out to a large up, degree. Yeah, yeah, not a hundred percent, but but these animals' digestive systems are so freaking awesome, so complex um, that whatever they eat and consume or whatever they're exposed to is detoxified through that system. Mm -hmm. Versus monogastric animals, which are things like chickens and pigs, and, and they're fine, you know, and fish. Um, they don't have that fermentation process. They don't have that transformation process. And so, typically, what those animals eat they're very much like human beings. Like what we eat, we become, right? Yeah. So we, you know, if I want protein, I need to eat protein. If I want magnesium, I need to consume sources of magnesium. Mm -hmm. um, so they're the same way. If they eat like crappy feed, soy corn, uh, you know, like uh, all the things that some of these industrial animal, animal op feeding operations are fed, then when we eat the flesh of those animals, we're typically getting those things as well. Yeah. But, but cows and ruminants and like you said, wild game, they just, they just don't do that. And that's why people feel so freaking amazing. It's like, do the opposite of everything that we've been told to do and you're probably on a good path, right? <laughs> it's so like counterintuitive to what we've been told though. It's probably hard to like- But it's not working it. for everybody. No. So if, it, you know, the, we've heard for so long, like red meat, if you're going to eat meat, it needs to be chicken. Do the opposite. Like wow. I, I rarely eat freaking chicken. Have you ever seen a Tyson meat. chicken farm, man? Have you seen an industrial cattle I've farm? I've seen it on YouTube videos. God, it's sad, dude. Yeah. That's that's why I'm a, and that's another thing about bringing it back to the wild game thing, man. It's like- you have to have so much respect and humility for animals out there. At least I do. And there's, of course, there's going to be shitty, bad actor hunters out there and fishermen and all that stuff, right? And uh, you have to have, there's like, there's a certain dose of humility and respect to have the realization and the ability to either let the arrow fly or pull the trigger or whatever you're hunting with to understand that that animal is dying to sustain your own life for you to keep yeah, living. following up the kill and then cleaning it like it, it is it's an sacred, opening, yeah it's an eye-opening experience for a lot of people and the majority of people that i talk to that go through that experience they have a reverence for it mm -hmm. and they appreciate the food much more oh, it's God, not like yeah, they it, it makes them averse to it like it's something about it connects them to it a yeah. little bit more yeah you know? no it's intimate man it's like yeah. you it's it not intimate in the sex in the sense of like sexuality or anything like that that's fucking weird but like intimate as in like you have a, a relationship and the understanding and like that is sustaining you, your family and whoever else partakes in this, like this, this elk backstrap or yeah. whatever it is, you yeah, know, there's some work that went into it. There's a lot of work yeah. too. underappreciated. Meanwhile, like, you know, corporate farming, it's just like, Oh, here comes a cow to come <laughs> conveyor belt. There it goes. It's diseased. It's sick. I mean, it's still better for you than, you know, the other choices, like you've said. Yeah. But, well, even cattle, you know, like, um, you, uh, man, there's a, uh, I'll, I'll plug you into a couple of really good books. Um, one of them, Sacred Cow. Sacred Cow is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and they go through this nutritional analysis of uh, conventional beef versus grass-fed and 100% grass-fed and organic and all that stuff. And there's almost no difference whatsoever. No shit. But, um, but the majority of cattle, I mean, all cattle are raised on grass yeah. the majority of their life until mm -hmm. the last sometimes three months or something like that. Dying in love with some feed. Yeah. So it's like, um, you know, you talk about feeding operations with chickens and pigs and, and those are real and, and even fish relatively horrific. Yep. Most cows, when you see them anywhere they are, like they're freaking, they're out in the pasture yeah. you know? For the until their part. last few days, you know? So, um, I, I guess that's another positive or benefit of, of eating, uh, herbivores and gals, cattle. Yeah. Beef. And there's something else about like grass fed cattle or like pasture raised cattle where it's like you got rancher Bob out there and this cow's been out there its entire life and it's just chilling, doing cow stuff. It's relatively happy, I'm assuming, because it's doing cow stuff. <laughs> it's doing its part on nature. It's, you know, it's fertilizing the land. It's doing all this other stuff, right? There's all the other cascading and fallout benefits of that, right? And uh, if you, it's like the taste of like grass fed, like 
true well-raised beef and the, like the fat is like it's not like that like sickly white it's not that like weird color it's like a yellow it's like different right yeah it has and an it authentic tastes, taste to oh it for sure. god it's almost gamey in a way yeah. but it's it gamey in a good way it's like yeah. you can't replicate that any other way yeah I, I i i just i don't get tired of eating beef i don't either i never get tired of eating that i get tired of eating other things i never get tired of eating beef i get sick of chicken i can get sick of fish i mean I, i'm a huge fly fisherman and i, I don't even catch what i you know, like unless i'm like out camping it's like oh cool you now fish sounds great yeah this brook trout is invasive i'm gonna you know take it i'm gonna harvest this game and probably eat it with my buddies like drink a beer around the fire cool that's different though but usually i'm a catch and release guy but between hunting and like like grass fed beef that's like that's my jam that's where i find the best feeling the best performance the best optimization yep. the best feeling in combination with salt i don't know why i perform very well on salt but let's exp let's like explore the importance of salt in our diets well it, salt's been traded for freaking thousands of years yeah. because it's super valuable for human health you know um uh, most of us probably uh, mineralize the drinking water that we use we embrace salt big time especially if it's an uh, denatured you know uh natural salt like a himalayan or a celtic or a redmond salt or something yeah, like that reds that's what i pickle my own uh, vegetables with is the reds real salt yeah yeah but, but the but the whole sodium chloride thing is just crucial for a lot of different functions and reactions inside the body uh, especially if you're like an athlete now you're probably depleting and, and blowing through minerals and then if you add to that like you're transitioning from eating processed food to going to something uh, a little bit lower carb or keto or carnivore or something like that mm -hmm. then as you're dumping glycogen you're also dumping a lot of minerals so that's probably one of those indications that your body actually really wants and needs that you know when you're craving salt and minerals it's Most of us kind of uh, hedge that off by like mineralizing our water and just fully embracing using salt on our foods. Yeah, and that's the thing. I guess it's not like a craving for salt, but I prefer salty and savory over sweet any day. Oh yeah, and I tolerate salt really well. Like I'll cook at my house, and my wife is like, eh, "Cool." And my friends are like, "Ah, oh, yeah, it's good." And like some people are like, "Holy shit, this is the saltiest piece of uh, ribeye that I've ever had." Right, and it's it's just weird. I guess I guess I tolerate it a lot a lot better. Uh, some or you like don't. the taste of it, you enjoy it, or that too. Yeah, yeah. 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 But minerals in general, I mean, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the foods that we're eating are, are not the same foods that our ancestors had access to. Okay. The soil has been completely depleted and most of the plants that grow on that soil are artificial for the most part, you know, so they don't contain the things that they used to. And so the animals eating those things don't contain the nutrients that they used to because they're not getting it from the plants, you know? So, so there's sometimes there's an argument for supplementing, um, or being conscious about deliberate, like, uh, mineral, you know, supplementation. Um, but, uh, I guess just paying attention to how you feel is a good indicator, you know. Speaking of mineral supplementation, like the popularity of like ZMA, zinc, magnesium, I forgot what the A stands for. A? A. Zinc, man magnesium. Something. Acetate? Maybe? A version of magnesium? I'm not sure what you're talking about. Yeah, it's like a, it's like a, it's like a zinc magnesium combination. I don't know what it is. I, anyways, it's a popular supplement and everything. It's supposed to promote sleep and health and all this shit, right? But um, let's talk about like uh, the importance of these like micronutrients, especially the underrated ones like magnesium and zinc, right? Magnesium, it definitely helps with sleep. I do know that, but I don't know what zinc does. Well, it's great for the immune function, mm -hmm. right? Great for fertility. Um, I think uh, a lot of times when we come in and we try to look at the different functions of all these different minerals, mm -hmm. they have so many different functions. It's kind of hard to nail them down into like what specifically is beneficial about these specific nutrients. If we look at it just a little bit bigger, broader picture, again, if we focus on the right foods, we're probably getting those things in the right amount of balance because mm -hmm. like this human body is a certain combination of a certain uh, amount of things. And if I'm eating animal foods that are close to mimicking and resembling me, then I'm probably getting those things in appropriate, you know, proportions. Yeah. Okay. So that's another thing too, is like, it's like, how do we, th let's go back to the supplementation thing. Like, so since we're kind of segueing into this, um, like supplements, right? They're not for everybody. There's some bro science involved with it, like especially like your pre-workouts and shit like that, right? But the protein powders, that might be effective for somebody, especially like if they don't have access to clean protein, red meat. You know, or they're trying to stuff. increase their protein or something like that. Yeah. yeah, su yeah. Supplement, right? Yeah. You're adding on top. It's not a replacement. It's adding on top, right? Yeah. yeah. So I, th I think there's... Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I think there's, there is... Um, room for some general broad supplementation for most people. I think okay. uh, COVID kind of pointed that out to a lot of us, right? Like people, a lot of people, vitamin D deficient, mm -hmm. zinc deficient. Mm -hmm. So there's like a baseline of things that I usually recommend most people take. 
And that would include vitamin D unless you ch uh, check your 25 OHD mm -hmm. levels and they seem to be sufficient. You know, you get a lot of sun most mm -hmm. days. Um, uh, vitamin C would be something most people would benefit from supplementing 500 milligrams up to 2,000 milligrams. Um, and especially if you're kind of uh, animal-based or carnivore-based because you're probably not getting a lot of that from animal foods. Um, magnesium is something that I throw in the mix a lot of times mm -hmm. because most people, if they check their nutrient levels, which most people don't do that when they go to the doctor, most people are going to be deficient in magnesium. Yeah, it was like something like some astronomical amount. That, like 60%. Yeah, 60% plus, mag yeah. deficient. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so and that's a result of like uh, poor soil. Um, but beyond that, like a lot of it is very bio-individual uh, based on symptoms and dysfunction. You know, like I come from uh, a substance use background. I mean, I just, you know, I just used to be that kind of guy. Still love to have a drink here and there. So um, I try to optimize my liver to the mm -hmm. best of my abilities. And there's certain supplements and nutrients that I take that I can see in blood work that I've seen healing happen. And I just notice it functionally and how I perform and how I feel. So there is a call for supplements, um, but it's useful to have a coach kind of pull you through that process to help you figure out like, what is it that you're trying to optimize for and, or what are your symptoms? Um, when I work with people, I have this really cool symptom assessment that I put them through. It's like 300 plus questions from that. Sometimes we can figure out, oh, wow, you are deficient in these specific nutrients. And so that might be a call for supplementation. Um, a lot of my clients uh, come to me initially with digestive issues, you know, like I'd say 80% of them. Mm -hmm. um, and the majority of that is low stomach acid. Um, really? And yeah. It was, low stomach acid is uh, usually the uh, precursor to a lot of other digest digestive dysfunction Polis, because that's that's ulcers. the first uh, entryway into the whole digestive system, right? So if you have a really strong acidic environment in the upper GI, then that triggers better digestion throughout the system, you know, mm -hmm. but that also means you're absorbing nutrients a lot better, you know? So, yeah. so a lot of my supplementation is um, uh, digestive based and, and it's not something that they have to be on permanently, although a lot of us take it, you know, indefinitely. So, um, so supplementation can be used therapeutically. There's like a baseline of things that a lot of people need to take that I think most people are probably deficient in anyway. And then, like you said, you can be strategic. You know, if I'm looking for performance or if I know that I'm trying to hit a certain amount of protein at a meal or in a day and I'm not hitting that, then a good protein powder would be useful. Okay. Now, how do we keep track of all this stuff? Like you got like everybody's at charts. It's like, oh yeah, you got like grams to protein per kilo of, you know, body body weight right you well, the kilogram that. thing throws people off i know right <laughs> you know? It, including myself i get to sit there and think about it for a second but yeah so for protein uh, first of all like we, we don't we're not huge fans of weighing and measuring you know no it's well, all guesswork man but it can be useful if that's something that um helps you stay dialed in on something so the awareness component is useful sometimes for people to More see this thing. is what i've eaten in a day oh wow you know i wasn't aware of that but um, a really good place to start, I call it SHT macros, would be um, focusing on your total protein intake for the day. And what's optimal is a gram of protein per pound of ideal body weight. Okay. So ideal oh. body weight. Um, and that makes the math super, super simple, right? Mm -hmm. So a gram of protein per pound of ideal body weight in a day. And then of course, before I was mentioning, like you have to have a certain amount of protein at each meal to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. And that's usually like 30 grams plus. That's like your maintenance, right? Uh, well, that's to help build muscle, right? Okay. So if I get less than 30 grams, about 30 grams in a meal, then I'm not stimulating muscle protein synthesis. I'm not stimulating my body's desire to create muscle and maintain muscle. Now that does contribute to the daily protein intake, but it's not stimulate. What we want is these pops of protein to stimulate the body to build and maintain muscle. Mm -hmm. So um, from a protein standpoint, if I focus on my certain amount of protein in a day, and then I'm making sure that my meals are good boluses of protein, Everything else can kind of work itself out. I usually tell my clients uh, about a half a cup of carbs per meal is a good way to kind of measure things out. And if you're still hungry after that, just eat more meat or eat some vegetables or whatever you got for sides, you know? Okay. And as far as the rest of the stuff, like macro tracking, I know that's real popular. I mean, is it beneficial? Is it bro science? I mean, it's, uh, do you really have to understand what you're doing to an exact T? Like I've seen people that are doing this and they have probably no fucking clue what they're doing. Yeah. Well, I mean, a lot, it works for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> again, anything that helps you be better than what you're doing right now, I think it's going to be a good thing. Like why do any diets work? Almost all diets work for someone that's transitioning off of eating inappropriately, right? Because it's helping them dial into something and something that's better. It's better than nothing at all. Right. Mm -hmm. But again, I think a simplified way to do it is if you focus on the protein piece of it, there's not much left to focus on because <laughs> like, so what's your ideal body weight? Mine? Uh, probably like walking around, not at a high level of fitness, just like 
my current sedentary, I'm a very sedentary dude. Now I have an office job. I run a podcast. It's, I have got two kids. I don't work out like I should probably about 150, 155. Okay. So 150 grams of protein in a day. And then do you, do you know how much meat you would have to eat to, to hit that? Probably a couple pounds, probably a lot. Yeah. So, yeah, like, so the numbers work out more really than you good can actually meat. physically eat probably. No, it's possible, but it's challenging. <laughs> it, <laughs> it, it can is. be done. It can. Yeah. And it can, but anything it, can be done with the proper amount of force. It's optimal and it's possible mm-hmm. and it takes some work, right? So for, uh, the numbers work out great with meat. So like a pound of meat is hundred grams of protein. Okay estimate, right? A quarter pound of meat is 25 grams of protein. So you're right. You'd have to eat about a pound and a half to two pounds a day of meat, right? Now, if you're focused on that, then there's not much room for anything else. Yeah. So that's why I call this simplified macros because, and again, it's not just eating nothing but meat, but if you're trying to hit your protein requirements, you don't have to worry about the fat because you've got fat in the protein source that you're eating anyway. And you're typically cooking with a little bit of butter, or, you know, whatever it is you want to cook with mm-hmm. avocado oil or olive oil or something guy. like that. Oh man. Yeah. yeah. So, well, regardless, you're still getting plenty of fat in meat, especially if you're eating beef. Mm-hmm. So, and then if you just measure out your carbs and keep those small, I think that's the best way to do it. But people that do macro programs, I mean, they're super successful. If someone's doing it the right way and they have proportions that are similar to that, it's just a way for them to keep themselves in line with something that's healthy or healthier mm-hmm. versus doing something inappropriate. You know, it's like a macros that's a real food based macros. Of course it's going to work. It's yeah. going to be great. Well, especially the people that do macros and understand and truly understand it, they typically have an an intent, an intention behind it, and they they have a goal in mind. Like they want to be a high level. They're they're gonna do the games, right? Or they're gonna do the open, or they're gonna you know get primed for the fire season or whatever, right? So I gotta understand like as long as you truly understanding like the macros and like what goes into it, and it's a lot of, a lot of stuff that goes into it, yeah. right? It to can optimize be. your body. If you have a goal and, and like this works for you, I mean, it seems like you got no problem with it. Yeah. I mean, it just feels good being dialed into something and having a plan, you mm-hmm. know, but I have seen this work with athletes. I've seen it work with distance athletes, CrossFit athletes, strength trainers. If you <laughs> I hate to keep saying the same thing, but if you are protein centric, yes. right. And it's animal food source protein and you're hitting these daily requirements, like it's just everything else kind of works itself out. It's kind of magical. I keep seeing a theme reoccurring here. <laughs> yeah. As far as the nutrition goes, it's pretty simple. Uh-huh. And and simplicity is great, right? Limited decisions are great, right? Yeah. It's just, uh, that's part of simplifying your life is like not giving yourself so many different choices. Yeah. That minimalizing so, thing. Yeah, yeah. So if I'm like focused on, I, I know I got to hit these numbers every day. And then I can be easy about the rest of it. And, mm-hmm. and again, like it's just something magical happens when you hit these protein marks. Um, you're not fighting yourself to try to stay away from these other foods. Like it's just an automatic part of the process because you don't feel like it. Like I said, when I ate that uh, breakfast this morning, like I have zero appetite right now. Mm-hmm. I'll eat some meat this evening when I get back and have half a sweet potato or something like that. But maybe a couple of drinks since it's Friday. Is yeah. it Friday? Yeah. <laughs> Is it five yet? <laughs> Here's the thing too, I think, like, so there was a point in my life where I experienced like a, a food detox and like, we're talking about nutrition and optimizing nutrition and like how it has all these like cascading effects throughout your hormone system, your body or sleep even. Right. Um, when I experienced this, I, my diet was shit. I was drinking way too much. I was a 24 year old little shit and I was just not taking care of my body because I could stay up all night and party and just have a good time. Yeah. Right? Super resilient when you're that age. I know you bounce back from everything. Right. And you're just like jacked to the gills on like that young youthful person hormone schedule. Right. And you just do it and recover mm-hmm. and you can't do that shit anymore. Yeah. But Anyways, um, I was doing jujitsu. I was doing Muay Thai. I was doing CrossFit. I was probably running about 30, 20, 30 miles a week. And I was doing firefighting during the summer. Right. And all this stuff was just like mixed in. I was like going through this like health rediscovery thing. But I decided that I was going to quit all the bullshit that I was doing and just go like strict paleo right off the bat. And I went through a gnarly food detox. I could not fucking eat enough. Yeah. Yeah. So what's up with that? Well, probably uh, an adaptation to making energy a different way, Mm -hmm. right? Transitioning away from the things that, you know, you were doing before. Were you eating a lot of carbs? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was eating like like the the huge bars and shit. Yeah, Yeah, it's a huge part of it. I mean, uh, there could be like some detoxifying issues. It's it's really just think of it like an adjustment. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like if I'm doing something, like if I haven't worked out for freaking five years and then I go do a brutal fucking CrossFit session, 
I'm going to be sore for freaking weeks. Yeah. You know, you might so, even get rhabdo. Yeah. You know, yeah. So it's, it's similar. You know, if you're transitioning to something, even if it's something that's better, if it's drastically different or you do it without kind of weaning yourself into it, then you're going to probably experience some quote unquote adjustments. Um, and uh, what's behind that is a lot of it's the adaptation to making energy in a, in a more appropriate way and being a little bit more metabolically flexible. Um, so if that's the case, when I'm working with people, like that's why I never have people go low carb right off the bat. And mm -hmm. that's why I'm not like a, a carnivore coach. You know, I'm, I'm animal based, meaning I'm protein animal centric, but like I'm a huge fan of carbohydrates, you know? So, so that was probably a big part of it. And it could be some detoxification issues and, and your body getting rid of some things that it's been holding on to. A lot of times when you lose fat, because fat's where the body stores a lot of toxins, like those toxins get released into the bloodstream. And, and so symptomatically we're experiencing you know, some of the things that are very unpleasant. So, yeah, especially the GI stuff, man, it was like demons coming out there for like three solid weeks, man. And it was like super loose stools. All of it, man. Yeah. It was like random, like, oh my God, I got to go right now. And it was just like, it was just, it was a weird experience. But then I like came out of like the dark corner <laughs> of yeah, this. The fog like, lifted. And, the and fog and lifted. Yeah. 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 So uh, just imagine this body like being exposed to all the junk that we expose it to when mm. we're younger, you know, and I was the same way. I grew up on freaking just junk food and crap food and, and still had six pack abs. I still worked out, you know, I was younger in my teens and stuff. I was, I was really big into fitness. I tried to eat as healthy as I could, but it, I just didn't know what I know now. But just imagine the shock to the system that happens when you actually start flooding it with really good food, mm -hmm. really good nutrients, really good uh, energy sources. You know, there's, it's, it's going to take an adjustment <laughs> in most of our digestive systems. You know, I remember before I found what I found here, I was taking Zantac every single day of my life. I thought there was nothing wrong with it. It was normal, you know, acid ingestion. Um, this is medicine. Say again? This is medicine. Yeah. So, yeah. and it shuts down digestive processes, right? So, um, you know, if we're not eating animal foods because we've been told that animal foods are bad for us and cause cancer and heart disease and all this other stuff. We'd lose our capacity to digest animal foods, which is why a lot of people come to me and they have low stomach acid issues. So it's, it's an adjustment, mm -hmm. you know, but thankfully you saw it through <laughs> to where the fog lifted. It was and, rough. It's touching go over there for a minute. Yeah. The payoff is, is amazing though, right? When the fog yeah. lifts and you're in this realm of like, holy moly, I didn't know that I could feel this good yeah. from just changing my diet. Mm -hmm. And that was the thing. It was very animal. Uh, it was meat centric, animal based uh, centric uh, diet. And, you know, it's, it's, it was like one of those experiments, right? You're constantly, you know, building your temple, so to speak. I hate using that phrase, but it, you are in a sense, right? And you're, it's like, would you put. Oh, you're talking about like your body. Yeah, your yeah, body. Yeah, yeah. Your body's a temple. You're yeah. building the temple, right? And you're constantly yeah. experimenting or like improving it or like putting a different coat of paint on or whatever, right? Whatever analogy you want to use, but it all boils down to would you put 87 octane or 83 octane in a Ferrari? I don't know which is the best one. <laughs> <laughs> the higher octane would be like, would you, all right. If you had like a dragster, would you put regular ass like out the pump I mean, gas in the, the best, dragster? the best. Yeah. Yeah. You got to get, put the good stuff in or else yeah. you're going to get shit performance, right? Yeah. You're not optimizing yeah. it. Yeah. And I see the utility in that. So it's a good way to think, you know, like we literally, we hear it our entire lives is you are what you eat, but mm -hmm. you literally are what you eat. You know, you build yourself with what it is that you're consuming. Yeah. But, you know, people have to have, um, I don't know, some experiential realization with that, you know, and do an experiment or work with a coach and, and you know, just feel the benefits for themselves. And then, and then they start to realize, oh, shit, this is the truth. You know, when I eat the right way, I actually do feel different and feel better and look better. Oh, yeah. Here's another thing, too, about like the paleo thing. I was remarkably astounded by how affordable like a very very strict paleo diet was yeah it is like when the people oh i can't do paleo it's too goddamn expensive but i'm like bullshit man like you have to eat less once you get past the the demon part <laughs> you have to eat less and it's like these very nutritionally dense food these very calorically dense foods and you're just feeding yourself that you have to eat less and it's it's overall cheaper than buying like your box full of cheeses and don't get me wrong yeah. i can crush an entire box of cheeses in one sitting well and how much things. how many vegetables do you have to eat to equate to the protein and the nutrients that you get from freaking eating meat and eggs you know All like them. yeah it's, it's a lot it really is yeah that that complaint i i do a lot of cost yeah. comparisons and like if i eat i eat, try to eat about two pounds of meat a day and that's literally like 11 bucks yeah that's not bad for a day. Yeah. And, you can <laughs> and then the fruit quality. and stuff is like a minimal cost, you know, sweet potatoes and rice and it's like, doesn't cost that much at all. So mm -hmm. what's your opinion on like dried foods and uh, like, uh, freeze dried? Mm, I'm sure freeze dried or just like whole, I guess, I guess a traditionally prepared thing. Like, so you, if it's like dried or freeze dried, like 
you still get that like benefit. Do you think? Yeah, I, mean, I, th I think yeah. to make this work in a modern lifestyle, absolutely. Fast mm -hmm. food's totally cool. Like I don't have a problem going and getting Wendy's double patty freaking burger without the bun. You know, like um, if it's real food based, it started with real food. I think it's probably um, has a possibility of being a good option. You know, so like dried foods, freeze dried foods. You know, um, preserves nutrients pretty well. I actually have a freeze dryer. Fruit pretty freaking awesome i've been eyeballing yeah. one at sportsman's and i was like four grand for that thing but i can like was it harvest right yeah i think yeah, yeah. it was like they're like five grand but yeah but yeah dried foods you know it's like if i if i need some of these convenience factors to make this work in my crazy modern life with kids and a job and a spouse and you know then um it's better than the alternative which is just eating bullshit yeah. you know what i mean so yeah absolutely well, these are like those little things that you got to think outside of the box with, with especially when you don't have the availability. You're getting your ass kicked as a firefighter. You're out in the middle of nowhere with MREs and like slop on a, like it, you're basically fed shit on a shingle at times. Yeah. Have you ever seen a fire lunch? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, I've, I've cycled through a ton of pictures getting ready for these talks that I was doing uh, yesterday, but yeah, what is it? You want to talk about a bag full of bullshit? You got nothing but like carbs you got like m&ms and stuff like that m&ms you got yeah. cookies you got nutter butters you got oreos you got the fucking uncrustable sandwiches I it mean, reminds me of the uh the uh three square or four square organization they had in las vegas i went to volunteer at it and it's like they put the, put, put together these boxes of food for kids and it was oreos marshmallows i was like what yeah which it tastes good and kids oh my god oreos fuck yeah i love oreos right well and it's you know maybe uh a rat, who puts that together for them uh it's contractors really. I mean, we have like the nutritional requirements that are set by NWCG standards and like some mucky muck that's uh, back in like the technology development center, like setting the standards for what our nutrition is. And I understand the need for carbohydrates and an abundance of them in to some degree. I was going to say there's the rationale behind that is probably to give, you know, some easy to digest and use carbohydrates mm -hmm. for people on the fire line and, you know, hitting things really hard. So I could see a rationale for that. If that's the reason behind it, but there's probably better sources for it. You know? That's what I'm saying. And it's like a bag full of the cheapest, lowest common denominator bullshit that you can ever see. And it's like five pounds of fucking crap and it sucks. And yeah, I understand the utility behind it. And it's cool to have like occasionally get like a bag of carrots. It's like, okay, cool. I like carrots, you know, mm -hmm. no problem with that, you know, but like the processed foods, I mean, I understand the utility behind that too, but it, like the rainbow meat beef wad sandwich man it's like a roast beef and it's like stacked this high with meat there's maybe a slice of like a craft of single on top of it and it's just like this dry ass like meat brick that you have to just muscle through and you need that stuff but god man there could it's got to be some better sources out there and i understand that they can't give you like a chicken breast or a steak or anything like that it's not yeah. gonna last right yeah maybe it's part of doing what they got to do um yeah. yeah. But I mean, thinking anyways, back to before I went down that rabbit hole, like thinking outside the box as far as like uh, those traditional preserving things, right? Like I know a bunch of firefighters, especially in the Pacific Northwest that like can their own fish or can their own meat or oh, yeah, dehydrate their own beef jerky or some of them. I, I, I know a couple of people that all like threw in on one of those uh, harvest right uh, food dehydrators yeah. and they make their own essential mountain house meals, man. Yeah. 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 No, it's amazing. Yeah. If it starts real and it's traditional preparation uh, and, and uh, preserving processes like salting, curing, drying, fermenting. Yeah. Fermenting. I uh, love fermented foods. I, I do great. Too. Yeah. Um, I used to, when I was in Vegas, I used to teach a lot of classes on uh, making kimchi, sauerkraut, kombucha, you know. Um, but yeah, all those things are great. I mean, it's, our ancestors have been doing that for a really, really long time. Mm -hmm. And it's easy knowledge to gain too. I mean, if you're to bake your own preserves or your own beef jerky and stuff like that it's not rocket science to do yep. man it isn't it might be a little bit expensive on a startup for a dehydrate a decent dehydrate it's like probably 200 bucks man yeah cool. yeah but that thing if you can just constantly pump meals out from it you've got like if, if the shit hits the fan you've got a great food source and i, I think i've got in my trailer right now at least three months worth of freeze-dried food oh yeah yeah and it's easy to just stock up on that stuff well it's easy yeah. to stock up on this stuff and especially yeah. if you have a food saver man you want to talk about like buying in bulk and that affordability factor of quality food man if you go to costco and like you get instead of like the package of ribeyes or steaks or sirloins or whatever chicken even and whatever you flavor is if you just get the whole ass roast and do the butchering yourself you're going to save it even more money yeah. and you throw it in a food dry a food a food saver bag and you freeze dry it throw it in the freezer it lasts forever dude freeze dried food is like actually not that bad at all no no yeah but yeah 
It's just like making things stretch out though. So while you were here, dude, you did a big uh, presentation on sleep and like the importance of sleep and nutrition obviously ties into that physicality and the fitness ties into that as well. So let's talk sleep. So if, if I had to focus my efforts in uh, the most important things, it would probably be nutrition, fitness, sleep, quiet time, right? I mentioned that in the very beginning. Um, I think sleep is like one of the biggest missing links for most people because we're all so used to just going and going and going and we sacrifice sleep for everything else, you know, I told you my story this morning, especially man. to get things done, you know, and, um, but sleep, the people that <laughs> there was one, one guy that was in one of my talks yesterday and he got it. He's like, he understands like when you get a good sleep, everything else about your life, just immediately that next day or the morning you wake up is better. Because mm -hmm. sleep is so crucial for every physiological, biological, psychological function that happens inside the body. It's the time that the body um, restocks its immune system. It fights infection, malignancy. That's why people that sleep really good rarely get sick, and especially if they got the nutrition and stuff dialed in. Um, it's also when your body resets its metabolic state, you know, so like, um, when we wake up in the morning, we should be our freshest and our best to make energy properly. If I don't sleep well, like I'm typically going to, you ever notice how you're like super snacky when you're tired? Oh yeah. Super carb worst. craving when you're tired, you know? Yeah. Um, so, you know, having good sleep helps you with your fat loss goals. It makes you feel better, create energy in a better way. Um, you have better appetite control. Um, also it's, uh, when you modulate like your cardiovascular system, because, you know, theoretically, ideally when you're sleeping, like you've got this trough of a pulse rate, like it's super, super low, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, if you have sleep trackers, most people would notice like if they're sleeping good, then yeah, they should notice like a, a pretty low pulse rate. So, um, uh, but also sleep is when the body heals the physical body, you know, during the day, it's like all systems go, you have a lot of input, you're experiencing a lot of things and you're using the physical body. Sleep is when the body heals itself physically. Um, it's when it gets rid of, uh, memories that don't serve the body very well. And then it also uses dreaming as this, uh, kind of like a virtual reality, reality to integrate like current experiences with the memories that it chose to keep. So that when you wake up the next day, you have this reset emotion, emotional state, mm -hmm. and you can deal with that day's challenges a little bit better. You know, it's like, it's very primordial, very evolutionary. You ever notice like sometimes we were talking about this yesterday too, like if you go to bed and you're pissed off or upset or you just had an argument, you know, with your partner or something like that, and then you wake up in the morning, you're like, like, you feel different about it. Yeah. Like, you're like what the fuck was I so concerned about? Yeah. Why was, why was that a big deal? Yeah. Yeah. You know, sleep on it. You know, one of those old adages. Oh, yeah. But, um, but yeah, like sleep is just, it's magical. When you start to fall, I think for a lot of people, the easier place to start is, is food and fitness because that's just what they're used to. But sleep is, is where it's at. It's so precious. It's just like nothing is going to mess with my sleep now. You know, like I used to be, um, well, I, I, maybe I just didn't understand the importance of it until I got into all this. But I remember, uh, in Vegas in my early years there, we'd go out and, you know, hit bars and things here and there. And and I was the guy that my, I'm like, all right, I got to get to bed here in a couple of hours. And, you know, of course people get pissed off. Oh, I'll stay out. Yeah. Come on, man. And Come then, on. yeah. And then after a while people just got used to it and they stopped inviting me because they I'm just not going to stay up. Late, you know? I Irish goodbye the fuck out of people the other night during the bowling tournament. I was all like, yeah, dog, I, I got shit to do tomorrow. Yeah, I'm exactly. Out. I'm out. Like, I want to live life. Like, I want to feel good. Yeah. And if I don't get my sleep, like, I just, it's a night and day difference. Mm -hmm. You know, I guess pun intended. But. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's another thing, too, because you have the inverse there, right? You say sleep on it. And if you went to bed pissed off and you got decent rest and then you wake up in the morning, you're like... <sighs> Ever, man. Yeah. You know? Your emotional states reset, your body feels better, you recover better, your your workouts are going to be better because mm -hmm. you're recovering better. Um, you know, uh, sleep deprivation, there's not a single health condition that's not made worse by sleep deprivation. And, and the flip of that is if I can prioritize my sleep, and again, in synergy with these other things, like it's, um, it's, it's something that's noticeable almost immediately, mm -hmm. like the first night. Oh yeah. Well, I, I think about it on the inverse of that. You get good sleep and you had that argument with whoever and then you went to sleep and you're like, fuck it, right? And you get the inverse of that, right? You don't get good sleep. When I wake up in the morning and I don't get sleep, good sleep and I'm fucking terrible at my sleep hygiene, right? I'm terrible at it because I'm just always in the go mode, right? Um, when I wake up in the morning, it's like the most insignificant, stupid shit pisses You're me off. You're just freaking irritable. I'm yeah. so goddamn irritable. I'll, yeah. I'll like everybody bitches and like, oh, you stepped on a Lego. That's like stepping on a minefield in Cambodia. Have you ever stepped on a like chewed up Nyla bone from a dog? <laughs> yeah, Holy shit. Time. This is dude. It is like, that is criminal. It is like a, a 
like laws in the Geneva Convention should be written about <laughs> fucking chewed up Nyla bones, right? It's a war crime when you step on one of these things and it's just like ruins your whole day. And then that escalates and snowballs. You slept like shit and it just keeps yeah. snowballing and snowballing. Yeah. You just and you don't even realize that's why. Like yeah. you're in a funk mm-hmm. and you don't know why. And you track back and you're like, oh, yeah. that's it. Like it's, it's sacred. It's so sacred. It is. And there's a lot of things that interrupt uh, sleep, right? Like alcohol. We're talking about like a bunch of young men and women, a very young person sport and wildland fire in the military and in yeah. law enforcement and all these people that keep you safe at night. We go blow off steam at the bar and we're notorious for drinking. Yeah. And that is a huge sleep interrupter. And then we're like constantly like the social pressures of staying out late and then doing all this shit and drinking more and just compounding it's freaking interest, tough, man. man. But, but I'm glad you're bringing that up because yeah, alcohol just before bed, it's just like, yeah, you know, if you're me- measuring your sleep with a sleep tracker or monitor, like your pulse rate is just all over the place, you mm-hmm. know? So even if you feel like, like you pass out easier, um, you're not getting good quality sleep. So, but you know, it's tough, man, because it's like, you know, there's all these things that, you know, we could or should change, you know, as we're talking about all these different things, you know, there's just things that we hold on to because we really enjoy them. It's mm-hmm. like, you know, but at some point you have to realize that if I want to live my best life, if I want to show up, it was my best to the things that I actually care about. I got to make myself and my health a priority, you know, and these things, you know, Maybe starting small, making small changes and adding to them over time um, is probably the best way to do it. But at some point, yeah, sleep's got to be a part of it too. Oh, yeah. And it's like the, like you even mentioned it too, like the, the, the fallout from poor sleep. There's not a single thing that it doesn't affect, like for good, bad, and worse. I mean, you could have cancer. If you get shitty sleep while you're getting, you know, if you have cancer, it's going to get a lot worse a lot faster. I only get sick when I don't sleep. That's yeah. it. That's the only time that I get sick. <laughs> Here's a funny thing, you know, funny insight about kids. Like as soon as my two year old started going to daycare, he was just dragging shit home all the time. And it's all like this, this little, little turd sleeps like a rock. He goes to bed every night at like 637. He sleeps great. He slept all through the night and wakes up at like 536, maybe sometimes seven if he's like had an exhausting day. But he'd bring home sick the, like germs and stuff from daycare. He's picking up stuff because he has no reference frame of reference for his immune system, right? Mm-hmm. He's picking up everything new. God, dude, I, you there guys has, catch it and he doesn't <laughs> No, he catches it, but he's oh. like, fine. He's just yeah. doing his two year old shit. Right. Yeah. But my God, dude, there hasn't been a single month that I have not been sick this entire experience of two years, dude. It's one of the great things about having kids. Huh? Oh God. Plague bringers. <laughs> but that's sleep thing though. Right. If I guarantee you, if I got better sleep, if I yeah. wasn't waking up yeah. during the night and helping feed the baby or rocking something to sleep, rocking someone to sleep or whatever, you know, checking on the kids. Cause you get that, that, that paranoia thing when you have kids, right? Like, what is that? You know, you gotta yeah. look and see, yeah. wakes you up, it's, right? It's instinctual in you. But yeah, it's that probably one of the best pieces of advice when you first get sick or you feel that little tickle, that little itch in the back of your throat, mm-hmm. rest. Like you gotta rest as much as possible. Oh yeah. So sleep hygiene though, too, that's, I think that's one of those things that you briefly talked about, uh, the other day. Um, let's talk about sleep hygiene. Now. Yeah. So best things you can do for sleep, right. Uh, to keep it super simple, you got to be consistent with your schedule. That means same bedtime, same rise time, most days or around the same time. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, because your body has to be able to anticipate that rest period. And so it can fully commit to it. Right. Yeah. If it's haphazard and I'm like, you know, during the week I'm pulling all nighters and I sleep in it on the weekends. Like it's just very hard for the innate intelligence to commit to a full recuperative process, you know, so consistency crucials. That means that, uh, during the week, you know, bedtime, rise time, same as on the weekends, ideally, you know, um, and then mimicking the day during the day, mimicking the night during the night. Right. It was almost self-explanatory, but uh, mimicking the day during the day means that when the sun is up, like I want to be experiencing light and brightness. Mm-hmm. You know, I want to be outside. I want to be letting that brightness hit my retinas and my eyes and hitting my skin. That's giving me a signal of activity. That's helping me set my um, circadian rhythms and my hormone patterns. Um, if I get early morning light, which I think is the most beneficial and important light that you can possibly get, like natural light into your eyes as soon as you wake up or as soon as the sun comes up, then you're kind of anchoring that morning uh, hormonal pattern and uh, cortisol spike. And then that's going to translate into a lot of other beneficial effects throughout the day. So yesterday we were talking about the importance of getting outside and getting sun throughout the day. But if I had to prioritize 
a, a moment in that that would be the first morning light that you can possibly get. You know, so if you wake up before the sun comes up, then making sure you step outside and catch the sunrise. Um, if you wake up after the sun comes up, like literally getting out on the porch and getting outside, no glasses, no sunglasses, and letting that natural light hit your eyes. So mimicking the day during the day basically means early morning light and then ideally punctuated light throughout the day. You know, like you're stepping outside, taking a break or something like that, because every time you do that, your body's getting these signals from the sun. Like there's uh, the position of the sun. Um, there's the intensity of the light, depending on where the sun is in the sky. Season. And season too, that can change. And so your innate intelligence is picking up on all that information, right? And the more times I get outside, it's like the more data I'm giving my body the more data I'm giving my innate intelligence. And at some point it figures itself out. It's like, okay, all right, this is what I need to do this. And this is why I should do this. And yeah. this is why I should secrete this. So that's the day part, you know, um, mimicking the night at night just flips that, you know, when it gets to be sun sunset or a couple hours before bedtime, you want to minimize your stimulus. You want to minimize brightness. You want to minimize down. Yeah. You want you just think cool, calm, collected. Um, you know, it's, it's not ideal to be on your TV and, and iPad and smartphones and things like that. But if you are just being aware that, you know, like I want to, I don't want to keep this right in my face and have a lot of bright stuff going on. And the mental stimulus for a lot of people is, uh, is probably problematic but but that, it, to keep it simple it's consistency and schedule mimicking the day during the day getting brightness as much as you can then as soon as the sun goes down a couple hours before bedtime just like trying to chill out making everything cool dark dim um, and minimizing your stimulus that explains a lot like from the input output kind of perspective like the the data inputs right so we have this thing where we're in fire camp and like there's a lot of noise. There's some a-hole like slamming the shitter door, the blue house, the blue room door at like three in the morning. There's somebody arguing with their significant other on their phone. It's like a lunch is chaos, right? Yeah. And you're trying to sleep in fire camp while some person is trying to back up a fire engine into a parking yeah. spot. It's yeah. just chaotic yeah, 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 and you yeah, can't do yeah, shit about yeah, it, right? Yeah. I heard some stories yesterday. About oh, yeah. That, but, but I mean, you know, we did talk about specific to you know, the fire line, right? Mm -hmm. Um Blue light blocking glasses, I think, would be crucial for all firefighters, right? So they actually you understand work. what those do, right? I'm, I'm not familiar with like what they do, but well, I've so heard like that they if work. I have this light in this studio blasting me in the face, like mm -hmm. after the sun's gone down, that's tricking my body into thinking that it's not this time of day. It's like sun, you know, it's during the day, right? Yeah. So, so then I'm going to delay my melatonin secretion by two or three hours. Yeah. So anything brightness, you know, exposure, uh, whether it's like the camp where they call it the TCOP or something like that, the, um, uh, oh, ICP. Yeah, ICP. ICP. Yeah. So like, you know, they have a lot of lights there, right? You know, of course they have to, cause they're, it's a, this is the operations. But um, any brightness is going to um, mess with your sleep. So I think having some blue light locking glasses that are from some uh, reputable brand, I got three brands I recommend. If you put those on as soon as you know that you're going to be coming offline or, um, you know, a lot of times when you come offline, you have to do hygiene and rehab your equipment and, mm -hmm. and do some eating and stuff like that. So maybe if that's your reminder to put those on, then within a couple of hours, like you'll be tired and ready to go to bed. So that's going to help facilitate some better quality sleep. And then as far as the noise, we talked about setting up your sleep situation as far as possible from from that camp or from the um, the ICP, uh, you know, uh, and I guess you'll have some rules or guidelines as far as how far you can go, but like setting it up as far away as possible. If it were me, I'd probably lay in the tent and, and point my head towards the camp so that if there were bright lights coming from the camp, they I wouldn't be seeing them through, uh, through the tent, you know? Yeah. So, um, and then having like a noisemaker, maybe some earplugs, eye mask or something like that, you know, you can get uh, some portable noisemakers that have like a good little ambient white noise or something like that. You can still hear important sounds if someone yells at you or yells your name or comes, tries to wake you up, but it's drowning out a lot of that uh, noise that you said was kind of irritating. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. What do you think about that? Those are some things we talked about yesterday. I think uh, there's going to be a cultural um, resistance to wearing blue light glasses, but the other Does stuff- they look weird? it's just like uncouth. It's like, Hey, you're not part of us. You're the standout, oh, yeah. you know, there's that cultural thing. That's it's a visible not, something that's separating you from everybody else. Exactly. Yeah. It's like, there's like the whole stigma about putting your gloves on your carabiner and put them on your hip. Right. That's like uncouth. It's like, Hey, we're the cool guys and girls. We we're, we're the cool people camp over here. We don't we, do that shit. We've got to make the glasses cool somehow. That <laughs> I like well, being different, but you know, I like sleep. I think I, sleep's pretty fucking cool. Yeah. Personally. So. I remember when I first started wearing them and I'm, you know, out at restaurants and stuff and you get some looks on Sometimes, but I mean, they're becoming more and more 
uh, mainstream. Yeah. Like you see more and more people with them on. They don't look so bizarre. Like yeah, it's not like, hey, look at Bono over here. You yeah. know, it's like yeah. with his red sunglasses. Yeah, yeah. they actually look kind of cool these days. So. Yeah, yeah. And that's the thing, though. It's like the cultural acceptance. It's like that whole like the like the woo woo conversation that I have with Walker. And like, if it works for you, it works for you. It's like fuck whatever people think. If it works, well, and for what you. if a doctor prescribed it, right? Yeah. Or a nutritional therapist? What if someone said, hey? You got to wear these. Mm -hmm. you, know, you have to because your sleep is wrecked. Your health is wrecked. If you don't do this, like it's not going to end good for you. Yeah. Like people will do it. Right. Yeah. So it's almost like you have to look at it like, okay, this is a priority for me. This is a medical It's going to help my health. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But I, I did do, and I got a lot of shit for it, but I'd never sleep in a tent. I always sleep in the stars unless the weather was crap, right? And then it's sort of a tent, right? And it's kind of like one of those cultural things too. It's like, and plus I love sleeping on the stars, but I'd always get shit for wearing the sleep mask and earplugs. I mean, I would do that. I, I you don't seem like the kind of person who will give a shit about people giving you shit about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there's still, maybe at the like, time, you know, maybe at the time, and yeah, now yeah. I don't give a shit, right? I mean, I don't care, and it's, I don't care anymore. But at the point, I, I very much did. You know, I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to be the outsider. I didn't want to be. I wanted to. It's it's like a forced conformity, but it's part of our culture. You know, it's like. Yeah, you got to respect hierarchy. You got to fall in line. You got to do what we do. And this is how we've always done it. But we can try new shit every once in a while. But let's try not to make a big deal out of it. You know, and there's more of an acceptance of like thinking outside the box these days. So like when I was coming up through it and like you clip your your gloves to your carabiner to your belt loop and you're like, you were like, find, you know, we have this Cooth fund thing That's going, funny, you know? Right? Yeah. yeah. But, well, I yeah. mean, the fact that they're having these talks, you know, means that they're open to this info. Precisely. And it sounds like um, some of it can be like a top-down leadership movement. Imagine if you're, um, what do they call the leaders? Of the, like in the army, we had squad leaders, platoon leaders, you know what? Yeah, we have uh, like superintendent, assistant, captain. Yeah. Imagine squad if you leaders. had these people say, hey, look, guys, you know, this is the focus for this week. You know, uh, we're going to talk. Uh, I, w we I want us to focus on this one piece of sleep hygiene. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, you know, that, that takes away the whole like being different from everyone else because the leadership is supporting it, you know, yeah. or maybe there's, you know, a, I don't know, some support of blue light, black and glasses in some way, you know. Yeah. So maybe it could, could be useful to be like a leadership top down thing yeah. or have a test group. You know, I've always thought about like um, maybe just uh, having leadership do something themselves or they experience the benefit themselves and they'd be more prone to promote it. You know? Yeah. You just got to try it, see what works. Right. It's the, it's a great social experiment, but also human physical experiment too. It's like that whole like health, like health is holistic well-being well-being is like a buzzword and like it's just no different than mental health like what how do you define mental health i mean yeah, yeah we have these like like key pivotal things that mean a lot to us but how, what other things play into mental health or wellness as a whole or social health or financial health and all this other shit but it all like it's all uh cyclic and it all correlates to each other right if one falls like the rest of the dominoes tend to fall as well yeah I mean, that's yeah. why I've been so impressed with what, what's been put on here because they're focusing on a lot of things that I'm assuming a lot of other organizations out there aren't doing it like this, you know? Like, Not a lot, no, uh, yeah. in my experience, but things changed yeah. from the last five years, so. Yeah. Very forward thinking, but, you know, I could see at some point in the future, if I was running like freaking the show of something like that, like it would be like, you know, they're, they're the norm. Blue light blocking glasses are the norm. Eating mm -hmm. meat and protein is the norm. Yeah. Yeah. Resistance training is recommended because it makes you a better freaking performer yeah. when you're out in the field. And that's the thing is like, I'm all about building better humans. And I think that over the last probably 10 years in Carson City District here, in the state of Nevada as a whole, and it extends outwards to like the region four in general. It seems like they've been adopting these things and pushing the boundaries and trying new things and like being accepted and breaking those social barriers, those cultural barriers and just saying like, yo, it's cool. If you think this is your freak flag, well, fucking let it fly. There's no shame in that if it works for you, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think the truth surfaces over time, mm -hmm. you know? Um, like a lot of things that we do for health, uh, that we, that we know are the truth, you know, 10 years ago was just, it was, if you think it looks or, or seems or sounds crazy now, like it was just unheard of, you know, like I remember when I first started doing all this, like butter was still just like, people could not believe that you're, it was okay to eat butter. Mm -hmm. And now it's kind of mainstream that butter is way better than margarine. Right. Oh, yeah. And when we first started wearing blue light, black and glasses, like it just was bizarre. And now like so many people, it's like, a, it's a, you know, oh yeah, I've heard of that, you know? Yeah. So um, the more exposure I think people have um, and the more that things work for people and the more that surfaces, then I think the more, uh, I guess, 
uh, mainstream it will become because I think the truth is surfacing with all these different health habits. Yeah. And there's like a thought experiment with leadership too. And it's like, uh, it's, it's the first follower phenomenon, right? I, I don't know if you've seen this video, but there's like this dude is out there. He's got his freak flag flying and he's on a grassy knoll, probably like a fish concert or something like that. This is like probably somebody like, yeah, I remember fish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is probably someone that your average firefighter would probably not want to hang out with, but it's funny because you watch this video and you're like, what the fuck is this guy doing? And then pretty soon one person goes over there and starts Oh yeah, they start dancing. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. then next thing you know, there's like a, a gaggle of people. And that's yeah. the thing is the first follower phenomenon. It's like widespread adoptions comes, widespread acceptance comes from early adopters. Right. And I think that the, the state of Nevada with the BLM, the Bureau of Land Management, they're really good at adopting things and those early yeah. adopters. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, um, I think that speaks something to, uh, uh speaking your own personal truth, you know, mm -hmm. standing up for the things that you believe in you know, and being vocal about it. And part of that is with your health and yeah. the things you do for your health, you know, but especially in, in this world, the way it is today, man, the direction this thing is moving, um, the more people can stand up for what they believe in. And if you have the guts being vocal about it, it's great, but just uh, being the example of the thing that you feel like you represent or want to represent, I think is super, super powerful. Oh yeah. hundred percent. It's like this, uh, this whole podcast and this conversation, this is your truth, right? And you have the courage to step up and stand up and say something about it, right? Cause you believe in it, right? And it's worked well for you and it could be beneficial to others. It's just like Walker, like he was on the show previous, uh, recording here. Um, when I was talking to him, the amount of courage that you need to get up and stand up and share your truth about something as intimate as being on the verge of suicide. Mm. As long as that says one person out there, that's huge. Or my friend Kalina, she had cervical cancer and she survived it. And this is her trials or tribulations. She has shared her truth with a huge audience. And so now these, and that's a cool thing about like all these podcasts and all this stuff coming out with fire and what you do. And it's, it's reaching a wider audience. I mean, Joe Rogan, like look at how influential that dude is. Yeah. He's lifted the most minor of people up to like this noteworthy status. And I, that's, that's what I think everybody in the community is trying to do. It's like take these conversations and have them in a wider audience and amplify those voices much like in a grassroots movement. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then when you start talking about people sharing their difficulties and struggles, I mean, like you said, that takes a lot of courage. It's the ultimate form of leadership yeah, in my opinion. Yeah, it takes a lot of courage, but there's so many people out there that are affected by that in a positive way. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of people need to hear that, you know, and lets them know that they're not alone. Too. Yeah. Yeah. That's huge. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, back to the uh, sleep thing. Like, so side note there, like you got the fire camp, right? And you get shitty sleep. It's typically like horrible, right? And uh, when you're out and you're spiked out and we have spike camp, I don't know if you heard about mm -hmm. this. So spike camp is where you're like miles into the middle of nowhere land, right? And you're cut in line and you are forced to have like stuff flown into you and your support camp, your, your base camp is very remote. Like it's either fly in or hike in way out in the middle of nowhere. You want to talk about some of the best sleep ever? And it's all the things that Dude. you've like talked about, man. There's yeah. no noise. It's nature. You're sleeping on your stars. Half the guys yesterday said that they slept better when they're on the, on the uh, fire line than they did at home. Oh yeah. And I, I was did. like, I was like, all right, so let's try to break that down and figure out what is it that's different about it? That's the question. Mm -hmm. Try to mimic that in your home environment. Of course, we all came to the same conclusions. Like it's like, we're pulling ourselves away from the modern world and the chaos and the noise and the EMFs and the radiation and, you know, light, even though there's some, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's exactly what we're saying. Reconnecting with the things that made us healthy as human beings before all the craziness of this modern world. Yeah. And even if, when you wake up, you're getting that fresh, natural light, right. that circadian rhythm. You're watching the sunrise and That's it's right. a beautiful vista. And you're just empowered by the pine trees and the smells and the, the, and the it's, hard it's day beautiful work without before. you even thinking that it's beautiful, right? Yeah. You're just there for it. That's like a happy place now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've had some of the most miserable fucking nights and days of my life on the line, of course, yeah. but like, like something magical about those moments and watching the sunset. Yeah. yeah that's it. That, 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 that is happier by nature. Mm -hmm. Well, that's another good pun. Happier by nature, being in nature, but, Boom. but, it, but it's like, it's immersing yourself in these things that made us healthy as human beings before the modern world. And, mm -hmm. and anytime you get to taste or, or uh, connect with those things that support that, like you just feel different. Yeah. Feel better. And I know that like we have that joke with us, like we're paid in sunsets, you know, and, and you probably heard it a couple of times while you're here. Mm -hmm. So the federal pay scale is like shit, right? I mean, you're expected to take on an enormous amount of risk for very little pay. I right? thought firefighters got paid a lot. 
Not us, man, not the federal side. I mean, we're trying to make things better, but it's like your Cal Fire agencies, your state agencies, your municipal firefighters, right? The big red Reno fire, they're getting paid a, a adequate wage, in my opinion. They're getting paid for their worth and their their duties and the amount of risk that they take on, right? They're being, being paid, they have parity, right? They have pay parity, not necessarily equality because everybody's different, but whatever. They're compensated accordingly. Now, with some state agencies, some contractors, some feds, that's not the case. And we have this like kind of dark joke, this dark humor about like being paid in sunsets, but there's something magical about it. And there's a reason why we do it, right? We don't do it for the pay because nobody does. We do it for the sunsets and those magical moments and that being connected with nature and having a greater purpose and all this other stuff that goes into it. And it's like addictive. It's like you're chasing like oh, I get it. everything. Yeah, that's man. beautiful. Yeah, I it's- love that. It's nomadic. It's 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 poetic. It's all that stuff like rolled into one. It's it well, maybe that's sense. a big reason a lot of firefighters love what they do. In oh, addition yeah. to helping people and and being a hero, you know, mm -hmm. because you get to connect with nature yeah. to some degree. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily even say a hero. It's just like finding purpose and just just doing cool shit. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But yeah, and I think that like the sleep, the nutrition, the the total body health, the the overall wellness, right? That plays into your mental health a, a, a immensely, right? Oh, huge, yeah. Um, I can't even tell you how many uh, people come into my office and they're like, um, you know, they have a lot of anxiety and stress and depression, and then they get these things figured out, and they're just completely different people. Mm -hmm. Like within a couple of weeks, yeah. You know? It's a night and day difference, man. Yep. You're a different person. Yep. But that's another thing too. It's like when you're doing all this stuff, you're doing it for the sunsets. You're having those connections, those social interactions, right? You get to meet cool people like yourself. You get to have those epic sunrises and sunsets, sleep under stars, get some of the best damn sleep, even better than home, right? On the most comfy bed and imaginable, right? When you go as a seasonal employee, like what I've traditionally experienced is that you go from 120 miles an hour one direction to practically reverse and we kind of top brushed the topic when you first came over here right off camera and uh when you are cut off from your purpose your friends that battle camaraderie if you will i'm using that term loosely because i hate making comparisons to the military and fire there's no comparison no, i get it though yeah yeah it's hard. And then you're compounding it with a disruption in your circadian rhythm, the seasonal affect. You're talking about coming back from coming being back up. From yeah. It. yeah. Yeah. Shock to the system. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, try, doing your best to acknowledge, I, you know, I think for some people yesterday when we were doing these talks, it was like a, there was a realization like, oh, yeah, I do actually feel better when I'm out there sometimes, you know. Mm -hmm. So what is it about that experience that is making you feel better? And how can I recreate that back home? You know, so it may be people just hearing this, you know, like acknowledging that camaraderie, you know, going through shitty situations with other people doing the same thing. Like, that's what I loved about the army. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the stuff that we did, like it was, uh, it felt horrific at the time, but it's like, we were doing it with other people. We could laugh at each other about it and talk about it later, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but maybe just acknowledging, you know, there's that camaraderie piece and, you know, why is it that I'm sleeping better? Maybe now we can acknowledge, Hey, it's because, I'm immersing myself in a much more natural environment, um, you know, something along those lines um, and just figuring out what is it that is about that experience that makes me feel so great and happy versus being back here. And how can I recreate that or at least acknowledge it so mm -hmm. that, you know, that's what it is. But it's going to be a hell of a lot easier pill to swallow if you're dialed in on your nutrition and you're aware of your sleep and you're aware of all these things that play into your overall well-being, right? Happier by nature. Exactly. 100%. Like you dial those things in and you don't even have to try to be happier. You're going to be happier, guaranteed. Hell yeah. Well, man, Paul, I appreciate you being on the show. But before we go, definitely want to give you the opportunity to give some shout outs to some homies, heroes, mentors. Who do you got for us? Oh, my God, man. I got one guy. I know he's going to be listening to this. His name's Renee. And um, he's uh, he's been there with me since the beginning of my tenure career. You know, we've been uh, back and forth and uh, supporting each other. And um, he was a big reason that... Um, Oh, I guess he helped me make this decision to go off grid because I didn't really feel like I had anything else that I wanted to do, you know, and if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be here. Um, I got this uh, buddy of mine, John Lombard. I know he's going to listen to this and dude, that guy has just been unwavering in his support and his friendship and his loyalty and um, just my whole freaking community of people, man. They're freaking amazing. Um, uh, a lot of people I've worked with for years and they've been there with me through thick and thin. Um, 
yeah. Uh, and then my private clients, like they make me who I am, you know, as I work with them individually, this is where I get all my learning experience and they don't know it, but I experiment on them. And then, <laughs> uh, you know, the feedback that I get from them over time, of course, the experiments are based in a lot of, you know, science and logic and, but, um, but I'm thankful for them because every time I work with them, like they make me better as a practitioner and as a person. So, oh, yeah. Well, keep doing what you're doing and keep pursuing that happiness and hope that everybody that's listening to this pursues their happiness and finds their contentness. And it all starts with your base of needs, like your nutrition, man. It's, it's, it. It can be real simple. Yeah. Thanks for having me on, man. And thanks for what you're doing too. Yeah. Um, I can tell you're an inspiration to a lot of people and you're giving a voice to people that need it. You know, like, like you said, when we were talking before we came on, um, you know, maybe firefighters seem to be these... Uh, relatively underappreciated, underpaid, you know, occupation. And they put so much out there and they sacrifice so much. And it sounds like you're giving them a, a really, really great voice here. I'm trying like, to that's make. amazing. And it's not me giving them the voices themselves. Yeah. It's, it's, that's the mind fuck. That's the trick on them. That's, yeah, that's my the, experiment on them. That's the same thing I do with my co coaching, right? It's not me. It's them doing the work. It's mm -hmm. them, you know, putting all this stuff into practice. It's them living the challenges and going through the challenges. I'm just helping to highlight the best. And hell yeah. That's how you change the world. Empower people. Yeah. Well, Paul, thank you so much for being on the show, man. Appreciate it. Dude, appreciate it too. Thanks. And boom, there we go, ladies and gentlemen. Another episode of the Anchor Point Podcast is in the books with my good friend, Paul C. Tarina. And if you want to get a hold of him, well, just type in his name on the old Instagram. You can actually find him on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all that stuff. But if you want to support him, more importantly, I'll drop some uh, links with the Buy, my, Buy Me Coffee links uh, for his project here. It's uh, the Operation Rewild and his health coaching. If you want to get a hold of him. I'll throw all those links in the uh, show notes. So with that being said, uh, Paul, thank you so much for being on the episode, man. That was a pretty cool uh, speech you gave over at the uh, Bureau of Land Management uh, meeting there. And uh, yeah, glad to have you back any day, man. It's been a fun one. I hope that everybody really got something out of this uh, episode. And Paul's story is actually pretty unique. Uh, dude was in piss poor health. And uh, just by following his own recipe for his diet, he's actually managed to turn his whole entire life around. Dude got out of the military in 2002 and he's in his worst health ever, man. He was like 275 pounds, high blood pressure, pre-diabetic, major diet, like digestive issues, chronic inflammation. He switched everything over to his new diet and he is doing well shit he was even vegan for a while and that didn't work but now he's dialed in so hope you all take some notes on this one that's the rest of you i hope everybody's doing well and like i said canada i i i feel for you i feel for you folks on the ground i wish they didn't get rid of the uh some of the rap crews especially in alberta but that's a whole other different topic of conversation just like the fuel situation and yeah Folks, energy weapons, directed energy weapons, they're not starting these fires. I cannot stress that enough. Take the damn tinfoil hat off. Please, really, please. As for the rest of you, I hope everybody's doing well. And uh, yeah, of course, the episode is going to be brought to you by none other than Mystery Ranch, built for the mission. If you want to go check out some more, well, go over to www.mysteryranch.com. We got Hotshot Brewery. They are the uh, purveyors of some kick-ass coffee for a kick-ass cause. Of course, the proceeds will always go back to the Wildland Firefighter Foundation. So go over to www.hotshotbrewing.com and check it out. And nice but not least, we got the ass movement. My man Boo's over there. Go over to www.thefirewild.com and check out the ass movement where you can get 10% off your entire order by using the code anchorpointass10 at checkout. And of course, Bethany with the Firewild, also known as the Smoky Generation. They have an epic grant program. So if you're telling the story of Wildland Fire, go over there and check it out. Go over to www wildfireexperience.org. I always mess that one up. So anyways, but yeah, go over to www.wildfireexperience.org and check it out. Bethany, you got a kick-ass organization over there. Keep it up. As for the rest of you, you all know the drill. Stay safe, stay savage. Peace.